Um, so um, we're going to do a couple uh, uh, presentations and then really get to some more conversation at the panel level. And uh, I think that's what we want to hear about. So uh, I'm going to first of all introduce Brody Bueller, who is the uh, lead of uh, Accenture's postal practice globally. You've got something like 1,500 people working for you and, and about 60 posts as clients. Is that right? Uh, whatever. I'll let you know that. Uh, heavy duty, heavy duty in this space. And uh, does a lot of great research and uh, it's wonderful to come back and as a sponsor and help us <coughs> with um, some research they're working on now. Um, and, uh, and then Cooper Smith is with Business Insider, and uh, uh, I, I read some stuff that Cooper was writing about um, uh, in, in, in the e-commerce space, and it all of a sudden occurred to me that this guy be, is beginning to get it, meaning <coughs> where the e-commerce game is going, and that is down the, uh, down the supply chain towards logistics, and uh, this is where this is where the uh, the game will be won or lost. And uh, Matt um, is going to be talking with, with us about some uh, OIG work again in the customer space. And Gary Remlin is the uh, Vice President of Product Innovation at the Postal Service. So uh, we'll just kick off with you, uh, Brody, if you like. Welcome, Brody. Do it, please. I'll find the clicker. Um, and see if I can figure out how to work it. Okay, great. Um, I've got 600 seconds and 26 slides. Um, and I told him, John is in full freakout mode. I told him that if I wasn't done, he could pull me. So uh, there we go. We got a lot to cover here. So what I'm going to cover is this concept that we've been doing some research around. It's called Big Bang Disruption Theory. <clears throat> and what it is, is we, uh, this was not done by me. Uh, but we have an institute uh, for high performing business that, that goes out and looks at these sorts of things. And they look back and what they saw is that there was a new sort of disruption that had emerged in the market and it was much more dramatic and aggressive than we'd seen historically. So usually you see this sort of a nice curve and you've probably read books about jumping the S curve and that sort of thing. What we found is that there were disruptors that were coming through that were big bang and uh, extremely destructive in industries. And so we started to do some research around those. It's looking back, the first industry they looked at was the pinball industry. If you want to know more about the pinball industry, I can tell you all you ever want to know about the pinball industry. But, uh, uh, but that's where it starts and, it, and then it moves through, uh, forward from there. So I'm going to start off with a little bit about that concept just to give you some background. And then we're going to talk about how that applies to postal. So the strategy gurus, if I jump down here, can you see me? Or should I say, okay, I am short. Thank you. <laughs> Could I say again, you're short? The strategy gurus would say that you have to you have to compete on one of three strategies, right? You either can compete on price, think of the Walmart strategy, you can compete on innovation, think of the Apple strategy, or you can compete on personalization, think of a VIP sort of a model, right? Big Bang Disruption says that's been thrown out the door and you compete on all three. And if you can compete on all three, the companies that do compete on all three are big, big disruptors. They're cheaper, they're, they're better, and they're more personalized. And who doesn't want all of those things, right? So the best example that I uh, have, have found is what happened in the uh, GPS uh, industry. If you think about what happened with Google Navigation, look how long it took Google to get to 100 million subscribers. Uh, it's just under a year. Look how long it took Garmin, and Tom Tom never made it there, right? Day one of the release on the iPhone platform, 10 million subscribers, right? In one day, 10 million subscribers to Google Navigation. And if you think about it, it's clear to, uh, to see why. Google Navigation is better. Real-time updates. I don't get a CD that I have to load. It, it, it's it, it's a, a very slick user interface. It's cheaper. The, the best quote is from uh, Eric Schmidt, who said, we like free because our customers like free. Free is good, right? And it's more personalized. I always have it with me. I can carry that with me, and if ever I need in, in directions, I've got it, right? So Google Navigation was a big, big disruptor, and within a year of the launch of Google Navigation, TomTom Tom and Garmin had lost 85% of their stock price. 85% of their stock price. And here's the best part of that story. Google Navigation didn't care. And to be honest, 
really probably didn't even know what was happening in that industry. They built that app to drive adoption of a platform. And the fact that it disrupted that industry came out of the blue, wasn't on anybody's radar, but destroyed what had been a thriving industry. So, Big Bang Disruption is founded on this concept of Moore's Law, which is every 18 months, the, the, uh, the capability is going to get twice as good at the same price point. And for a long time, we've been traveling along the, the horizontal version of that curve, right? Now we've moved to the vertical, and the leaps are getting bigger. So what's twice as good as the flip phone? You probably remember your first cell phone. What was twice as good as that? Pretty easy to envision. I re distinctly remember having a conversation where I had a Palm Pilot, uh, uh, one of those early Blackberries you could only text with in a cell phone, and I said, I don't believe these stories about convergence. I want what I want to talk on the phone. I want to talk on the phone. I want to text. I want to text. I want to uh, organize my day. I'll use the Palm Pilot. I couldn't even envision what the iPhone would do. That's the horizontal. What's the next version of the iPhone look like? Twice as good as the iPhone. That's harder to imagine. And in 18 months, we're going to know, right? Because the Big Bang disruption doesn't just apply to outsiders. Apple's disrupting themselves. If you look at the curves of the sales of the iPhones, about six months before the next new one comes out, they've disrupted the old one. And people now expect that 18 months later, there's going to be something that's twice as good as there, as there was before. What we find in Big Bang Disruption, and we'll talk about what this portion here before it actually hits, we call it the singularity. Uh, what we find is that it's a bunch of failed experiments. So you fail, you fail, you fail, followed by ridiculous success. And the two that we uh, outline here, the music industry and the, and the ebook, think of what happened in those industries. There were lots of very interesting experiments. And then the right combination of product and situation and platform came together, and all of a sudden you have big, big disruption. Applied or applying Moore's law to three areas is really what I see driving this. Right? So smartphone, twice as good as it was before, and everybody has one. Network, twice as good as it was before. Think about five years ago what you could push through the network versus what you can push through the network now. Cloud computing didn't exist a few years ago, and now it's becoming prevalent and getting cheaper every day. And the combination of those three things means that we're putting near infinite processing capacity in the hands of pretty much everybody on the planet uh, over the next few years. And 18 months from now, it will be twice as powerful it is as it is now. We've seen big bang, big bang disruption in the postal industry already. If you look at what happened to transaction mail, right? How many years of growth followed by a cliff? We haven't seen it yet in advertising now, and we've, we're actually in the midst of the opposite of that. <coughs> Parcels, everybody's seeing parcel growth. So one question that we're spending some time thinking about is what is the big bang disruptor of those two aspects of this industry? And one, we'll talk about what might happen in parcels as we go through this. So I'm going to change gears just a little bit and talk about a little bit about some retail trends that we're seeing. First, shorter distances. Nexus, have you heard of that concept? It's a tax term. But basically, Nexus is what kept Amazon in a box, because they didn't want to establish a presence in a state so they could avoid sales tax. That's gone now, right? With the new tax that's going to be uh, implemented, uh, they now don't have a Nexus problem, so they're putting their facilities everywhere. Shorter distances is the norm. We're seeing that all over the globe. Free shipping, if you look back to 2013, about a third of packages had free shipping. If you look in 2014, over two thirds had free shipping, and that's a trend that isn't going anywhere. Nobody's gonna figure out how to take that back. If you look at the speed, and this is one that we've done a bunch of analysis on, but if you, if you look at what's happening with speed, Best Buy, when they went to fulfill it from their uh, local stores, was able to get a faster speed than Amazon, and they're continuing to bring that down. And if you look at the retail research, and uh, I imagine we'll hear more about that today, everybody is investing in speed. Online inventory, making it available, letting people know. This is one of the big demands from consumers of retailers 
and as this is some research that, uh, that we did within Accenture, we're seeing a tremendous amount of success in this space, right, of people making those uh, inventories available, but we're also seeing a tremendous amount of investment in this space. And when you talk to the retailers about what they're worried about from an omni-channel experience, they're going to talk about speed and they're going to talk about online uh, availability. Click and collect. You can see where we're seeing high levels of adoption. U.S. Uh, is still very low, but growing rapidly. And there, uh, I think the research that we did, 57% of the retailers that we interviewed said that click and collect was in their top five omni-channel priorities. Uh, significant investment in making that work. And the reason that they're trying to make that work is it's right down the core of their strategy, right? Click and collect means that they have to come to the store and it's the antidote to showroom, if I can get that right. And, uh, and then the last one here, at least I think it was the last retail check, uh, they're investing in new places. You see lockers, you see cars, you see, uh, you see um, investments with partners like Lawson's in, in Japan. Uh, and I think what we're seeing is this convergence of the pure plays, right? So uh, online isn't just pure online anymore, and brick and mortar absolutely isn't just brick and mortar anymore, anymore. but it's about convenience. It's about finding the right place to do the delivery. So that infinite processing capacity in the hands of every consumer, what does that do to the delivery industry? One, they can source spare capacity, so they've got a different cost model than everybody else. They have rapid scale. So an industry that's entirely founded on density now goes to entirely being based, uh, their profitability at least is entirely based on their ability to quickly scale up and down. Entirely technology enabled, right? And it's capabilities that weren't possible previously. If you think of an Uber sort of model 10 years ago, how could Uber have ever worked on a flip phone? And last, it's focused on just the last mile. We're not seeing broad investments in networks. In fact, we're not seeing investments at all in these crowdsourcing models in networks. They're investing in last mile point to point. Networks are coming, but they're not here yet. So where we're seeing the investment, and if you look at uh, venture funding in the crowdsourcing space, stay uh, is the biggest. The next is transport. Right? This is where the money is going, and it's a fascinating phenomenon. We're doing some other research, and I didn't bring these slides. We talked about them a little bit yesterday, but we're seeing pricing go down. I might have the price. Um, we're seeing prices come down pretty much everywhere at about a rate of 1% to 2% globally. A little bit different than this market, but we're seeing prices come down everywhere. We're seeing costs rise everywhere at about 2% per year. Especially in this market, that's troubling because fuel, which is one of the big costs, has been dropping through the floor. And so you look at this scissor effect that's occurring, and we've got a tremendous amount of venture capital going into this space. Odd. Crowd shipping models, uh, storage models, <coughs> delivery models, you, uh, you can go and, and, and look these all up. We've talked about a few of those already today. but. These new models have an entirely different business proposition. And that entirely different business proposition is all about being better, cheaper, and more personalized. This is the, this is the slide that I find most troubling because what we're seeing is there's continued investment in large fixed cost networks. So what you see across the top is the percentage revenue loss, right? So think of that as volume decline uh, compared to the variability of your cost structure. So if you if you look at the top left, if you have 10% of your costs uh, are variable, sorry, so a 90% fixed cost network, and you lose 1% in revenue, you're going to lose 9% in margin, right? Play that way all the way to the right. If you've got a big fixed cost network and you lose 10% of your revenue, that's a 90% hit on EBIT. So why are we seeing investment like this in a space that's in the middle of a scissor? Because they've got a different model. And their model is we can be profitable even in a highly variable economy. And the big fixed cost networks can't. So we're in the singularity right now. None of these new models have yet been extremely successful. But we're seeing a tremendous amount of investment 
in experimentation. And when we see this in other, when we have seen this in other industries, it's only a matter of time before they get it right. And when they get it right, we hit that big bang disruption. So what is better? According to these guys, it's that faster delivery, new value added services, and making convenience the key element. What is cheaper? Here's just some, uh, some sample, right? If you look at what LaserShip is able to do in their model, a buck fifty to a contractor, right? So they don't have any pension costs, no health costs, none of that stuff. That's a crazy model, probably not sustainable, but right now that's where we're seeing is commoditization in last mile. And then what is more personal, when I want it, where I want it, completely transparent so I see the whole flow and fully within my control. I decide what that delivery looks like. Those three combinations, right? Faster, better, cheaper. Uh, sorry, better, cheaper, and uh, more personalized create the right situation for a big bang disruption. So, what is next? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, but the research that we've done would suggest that there's a lot to worry about in this space. Thank you. How do I do on time? Yes, I don't know. I'm energized. Uh, I'm nervous uh, for uh, for some of the, some of the traditional folks here. If you look at that bike, from all in the room, UPS and FedEx and uh, Postal Service, with all that infrastructure and all these little startups. It's, it's like the saber tooth tigers, uh, certainly the uh, brave carpets. I don't know. Um, Cooper, uh, well, how do you see it? Would you let us know? Cooper from the side. This is this is a real this is this is not Cooper again doesn't come from our space, folks. Logistics. He comes from retail. Thank, thank you for welcoming me into your world. Yeah, and uh, you. happy to share some of the research I've been doing for the past few months. So again, my name is Cooper Smith and I'm a senior analyst with BI Intelligence. We are a fairly new research service run by Business Insider. And today I'm going to talk about specifically e-commerce logistics drivers. So some of the things I've already talked about, but a little bit more in depth in terms of e-commerce. So how important a factor is delivery to online shoppers? It's the most important factor. So shipping-related factors are the number one reason online shoppers <laughs> abandon a shopping cart. The reason this is a problem for retailers is because $4 trillion a year is abandoned in shopping carts. And about 60% of that is potentially recoverable by a retailer. Now these arrows, we've got a little bit of a formatting issue here, but these, these arrows are pointing to shipping and logistics related factors that made someone abandon the shopping cart. So there's quite a few there you can see. And it comes out to about 60% of people, so they've abandoned the shopping cart, but the shipping costs were more than they expected. And another about 60% of people said it's not because they were ready to make a purchase, but they simply wanted to see how much shipping was going to be. So online retailers have a huge incentive to improve these shipping and logistics related factors. Now, something aside from even just uh, the shopping cart itself, shipping and logistics can also get people to just buy them well. And that's why you see companies like Amazon, Google, Uber, they're going so aggressively after the space. About 15% of people said so they would shop more online for everything if they had faster delivery options. And about 10% of people said so they would shop more online if same day delivery was an option. But what you see here in this chart, we're seeing how many shipping options retailers have. This was in, in November. This fluctuates a bit throughout the year, depending on the type of merchandise a retailer has an inventory, also the time of year. But what you can see here is that traditional retailers aren't giving consumers the flexibility that they want when it comes to shipping. Amazon offers five shipping options on average with each product. That's way more than you see. Walmart, we talked about two. Costco only offers about one shipping option. Uh, option on average. <laughs> but shipping doesn't need to be a major cost center for retailers, and we see this with Amazon. So no one thought that Amazon would be able to sustain absorbing all these costs and undercutting its competitors, like offering free shipping, but now Amazon isn't just a direct retailer anymore, and Amazon's also acting somewhat like a fulfillment and operations company. So shopping revenue that Amazon is generating now from what's called the Fulfillment by Amazon program, uh, this is helping it offset its traditional shipping costs. And last year, Jeff Bezos said that the number of third party sellers on Amazon that are a part of FBA grew about 60%. And this is a big business for Amazon because 40% of the things that people buy on Amazon come from third party sellers, not from Amazon. This chart is showing you some of the fastest growing shipping options that we see. 
So in store pickup, 30% of people who buy online so that their preferred shipping option is actually going to the store and picking it up themselves. This chart will also show you how people have different delivery preferences depending on what device they purchase. So if they, whether they're purchasing a, a tablet, a smartphone, or a PC, they might have a different preferred shipping option. This again is why shipping flexibility is so important in e-commerce. Same day delivery is one important area that e-commerce is going really aggressively at. And the reason they're doing this is because it's breaking down really the last major advantage that physical retail has. Traditionally, if you wanted to get something, you needed it right away, you go around to your local store, you could walk there or drive there, and you would pick it up. But now e-commerce is conditioning people to say, okay, I can go online, find the best price, and I can get it right away. Now the actual use cases for saving the delivery, there's not very many, but what retailers are doing here is they're conditioning consumers to know they can get anything they want that they buy online immediately. So who uses same day delivery? So all those companies like Postmates, Uber, and Amazon, Amazon I, Prime, these are the people that are using it. This is the demographic breakdown of same day delivery customers. They tend to skew young, 25% of same day delivery <coughs> customers are millennial age. They slightly skew towards men and also urban dwelling consumers. And if you look at the millennial demographic specifically, it's actually the affluent millennials, ones that make over $100,000 a year, who typically use same day delivery services. And before I get to this chart, I just want to mention, we, uh, we did a chart yesterday, and I'm, I'm sorry I don't have it here today, but Postmates is actually becoming one of the fastest growing on-demand delivery services. Uh, they've been around for about four years, and we just got some new data from another show. They did 500,000 deliveries between December and March of this year. That's one-third of all the deliveries that they've done over the course of four years. So lastly, I just want to talk about drones here. I know that there's uh, you know, some issues with the FAA clearing uh, delivery by drones, at least for in residential areas. But when drones do arrive for deliveries, these are the types of products that consumers are probably going to want to be delivered by drones, and they're inexpensive items. So 75% of consumers said they would trust drones to deliver books, uh, as well as uh, clothing and, and apparel. But when you get down the line to more expensive items, such as like electronics and luxury goods, consumers don't really have a, a lot of trust for drones. So this is probably where we're going to see drones being used in the future we do in the U.S. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Cooper. And uh, certainly, you made up time for us. Excellent. And we, I think, got the point across. It's going to make for a good conversation. Matt, is this relate? You've been doing work again on the customer and uh, the OIG. So uh, please take it away. Yeah. And, and, I, and thank you, John. I think it's, it's actually a nice progression from, from Brody leading out with some, some disruption stats, um, leading Cooper's stats here. And, and now I'm going to come in and bring you some, some data around uh, the, the consumer need, what the customer wants, and some, some of the research that we've done. So if you're not familiar with InfoTrends, we're a market research and consulting firm. And, uh, and, and some of the, the data that we'll be sharing today it some of the, it comes from the research we've done for the Office of Inspector General. So if, if you remember from last year's presentation, we talked about the, the recipient needs, what, what consumers, what American, what American consumers want and need from the U.S. Postal Service. And that came out of research that we had done through focus groups all over the country. And uh, it ended up being 10 different focus groups where we talked to everyday average Americans. So that, was, that was the intent. And you can see here's, here's just a sampling of some of the people that we spoke with. But out of that research, you're not intended to read all of this. You can go back to last year's data. I'm happy to, to give you uh, access to the study, which is available on the Office of Inspector General website. Um, but some of the key points that came out of it. So the majority of, uh, of participants did not realize that the Postal Service is self-funded. Most participants valued the Postal Service as a community asset. Uh, reducing hours of operations at the Postal Service should not be a primary focus for cost savings. And then we get to point four, which I wanted to expand upon, which was that re residential delivery location and the number of delivery days represented the most likely areas for compromise. So when we talk about how content is being delivered um, and, and talk about the e-commerce move, we also think about how consumers are going to receive this content. Are they going to get it in their physical mailbox, um, in their, their curbside delivery, or potentially move to a cluster box approach? So in terms of, of the move to cluster box, 
we actually had general acceptance from, from the people that we talked to. There were people on both sides of that discussion, so, so some people, you know, Sharon and Camilla George, she was talking about other people who watch you come and go, we've had a problem with people using our mail and stealing our mail, right? And we actually heard this from a few different people that they said, I really want my mail to be locked up. I prefer to have it locked in a, in, in a, a cluster, neighborhood cluster box. And then you have Edward in Spokane, Washington, who said, you know, I like to see the mail, the mailbox at the end of my driveway. It's almost the, the protection, it, you know, he, he provides his own protection for his mailbox, but he likes the comfort of having it right there. Uh, so I can tell you that as we went through this process of talking about how customers are going to receive their mail, uh, when we got into letter mail versus packages and parcels, we did see some, some differences there. The, this, the preference for parcels tended to come back to the, the house. I still want the parcel to come to my house. I might want the, the letter mail otherwise. Uh, but at the same time, we had other people that said the parcel is actually more valuable to me. I'd rather have that locked up. Uh, and, and actually out of Cooper's data talking about how 30% of people with in e-commerce shopping experience actually want to go pick up at, at, at the store. Part of that could be because I don't want that, that valuable sitting around in my house. So, so out of that research, we actually did some additional research that was uh, survey based. And we, we did this on behalf of the Postal Office of the Inspector General. And this was in August, first, uh, August and September of 2014. We had 5,000 respondents in the U.S., so there's a U.S.-focused study. Uh, we aligned age, gender, and geography by the U.S. Census data. Uh, some, most of those were web surveys, but we also did phone interviews because we wanted to make sure we did a balance of web-based versus phone-based. So you can see that 88% that of people had internet access at home, 12% did not. Uh, I, the last point I'll note is just that this is a preview of some data. There's not a published report around the few data points that I wanted to share here, but, uh, but that is something that will come out later this year. So the first point, in terms of where consumers are receiving their mail, this actually generally aligns with, uh, with postal service data. I would say the cluster box data is, is very close. Curbside and door delivery. Um, curbside is actually a little higher. I think it's around 40% for the postal service today. Uh, and, and door uh, door delivery is, is a little lower in the low 30s. From a package retrieval location, we asked, where do you normally receive that package? And 83% of customers said it's at their door. They, they go to their door to, to receive that. Mm -hmm. You can see some of the other responses of that 17%, what's the breakdown? So only 6% of consumers in the US have a parcel locker outside um, that they're going to receive that, that parcel. From a security perspective, we asked, do you consider your packages and parcels to be safe where they're delivered? So 89% said yes, 11% said no. Compared to letter mail, we asked the same question. Letter mail was 94%. So there's a there's a there's a less there's a reduced feeling of safety from letter to, to package or parcel. Uh, where we saw the most yes responses was it's it's at my PO box, right? I'm it's already behind a locked door. I'm most comfortable. What was interesting is that most no responses came from indoor cluster box. Think of an in apartment com uh, complex or, or city dwelling. Uh, just inside the door of that cluster box, it might be easier for somebody to, to take your package than, than otherwise. Um, so so there's, a, there's more fear around that package or parcel delivery space. When, then we asked, this, we asked these consumers, how would you rate the level of service that you currently receive from the Postal Service? 73% satisfied, 13 unsatisfied, 14 indifferent. But what's interesting is if you look just at the, the consumers that are uh, that view their delivery location of packages as unsafe, the satisfaction level drops to 59%. So if, if I have fear around how my my packages, my my parcels are coming in, I'm less likely to be satisfied with the service that I'm getting from the postal service. Uh, then we then we moved on and we asked customers, we asked consumers, if your mail delivery location was moved to a locked cluster box, how would you react? So again, this is moved, not a new uh, not a new development, and that that is now my cluster box uh, cluster box by default. Uh, but if we moved your current location to a cluster box, how would you react? So 63% of consumers said, I don't like this idea. I'm, I'd be displeased. 17% said, I actually like this move. 20% were indifferent. Highest please feedback, this is from various uh, cuts of the data. 
people that are receiving their mail through a door slot today actually were most likely to be pleased about a transition to a cluster box, which I thought was a very interesting uh, response. For, for people that did not have internet at home, 29% actually were, would be pleased by this. And uh, PO box response, that makes sense because they're already, they're already receiving their mail in a lot of location. So out of this research, we actually did a, a round table with the Office of Inspector General and uh, with various stakeholders in the industry. And I just wanted to share a few key points from that in closing. Uh, a few of the themes that came out of that. One was that we can learn from some of the international implementations for customer box delivery. You know, what worked, where was the messaging approach, what messaging and, and approach needed to be adjusted. So we actually had uh, Sanjay Halliwell from uh, Canada Post come in and talk about what Canada Post was doing in terms of the shift to cluster box. Um, as, uh, uh, as, as we heard from Jim Cochran in the, in the last session, some people are worried about postal employee interaction reduction and the impact that that's going to have on the value, the value proposition to the postal service. So moving from curbside delivery to uh, to cluster box, what negative impact or ramifications is going to come out of that? And the last point was that it, if and when we, uh, or as we grow the community cluster box uh, presence in the U.S., it really needs to be just designed to accommodate for the age of e-commerce. So, you know, there, there's an expectation that you need more and larger um, uh, boxes relative, relative, ready for the parcel delivery. So as content is increasingly coming to home to the home through e-commerce uh, initiatives, that the cluster box is going to be, be ready to support. So with that, I will um, turn it over to Gary, and he'll bring, I brought us into the postal space, and Gary will take us home. All right. Well, first, uh, they did a great job of setting up the problem. I just need some help with the answers, guys. <laughs> so, but I think one of the things that we want to talk about is, uh, we talked about Big Bang disruption. And, uh, you know, one of the things I'm here to say is, what we're looking at and what we are where you need to find out is important because you know you look at companies that have dealt with big bang disruption and you get examples of ones that have done done and dealt with it and changed and you have other ones that have ignored. You have examples like Blockbuster who has gone out of business and Netflix on the other hand has really changed their model and really uh, adapted to a changing environment to grow the business and become bigger than, than they have. And I think that's why it's so important to talk about 2020 now. Because if we're not talking about the changes, if we're not talking about what these gentlemen talked about, then how do you plan for it? And how can you adjust? And how can you make sure you're not on the wrong end of the curve that Brody showed? And I think that's why it's important to be out there, to be thinking about the future, and to be adjusting. And you know, this is an inter interesting phenomenon because in talking, we're not in the situation where we're moving from videos, which were tapes, into a streaming world. We're talking about an industry that's grown. We're talking about a $200 billion market today, one that's projected to almost double by 2020 and the amount of e-commerce that's moving forward. But if we don't change what we're doing, if we don't adapt to the future, it was said the, the posts with heavy network presence could see their share of the market decline. And that's what we need to prepare for. So what are some of the changes that I think are going to be the biggest impact? And then I'm going to tell you how I believe we have to change as a result and what we have to do to get to this nimble environment where we're not on the 90% fix, but we've moved down that variable curve so that we can adapt as a post and be able to serve our customers better. So the couple factors that I'd like to point out that were touched on here was first born nimble warehouse. We talked about the uh, click and deliver, which is <coughs> you go into uh, Sears and you pick up your, your good there. I think that's something that's coming, and that's something that is being driven by the retail. 
And, you know, one of the things that retail is realizing is that if they can fight with against these pure e-commerce plays, they have to use their footprint to their advantage. And so they're looking at all the different ways that they can interact. But one of the things that, that's growing as a result of that is the ship from store. So it's not just click and deliver, but it's also ship from store. And as we can look at, at ways where a post, which also has locations in every, in every, uh, in every town, where we can marry the fact that we are going to that location every day. And by the way, it's only minutes probably away from a post office. If we can enable same day or next day delivery and cut out the steps of transportation and having to go through processing, we can meld our networks to be, off, to be able to offer solutions that are better off for the end customer, that are quicker, but all, all importantly, it's still looked at a solution that is actually more cost effective. Then as we implement that, there's not a reason for the customer to have to come to the store because there's an easy solution to get it there in a cost effective way. So these trends lead to solutions if you look at it and if you look at how your systems and how the industry systems and how we can play together to offer the solutions for the future to deal with some of these disruptions. Same day delivery, same thing. I don't believe that same day is going to expand to be something huge. But the same way a post has to offer a portfolio of services in case their customers want that, we're going to have to offer same day in the future. Because unless you have a, a portfolio of menu of services, then you're not able to fulfill the needs of the end customer. So, a lot of these things that we're going to talk talk about uh, are what we're doing to deal with what we think of the future and to plan for the future. Yes, same day may be small at this point in time, but there's a reason why merchants are getting into it, e-merchants are getting into it, posts are getting into it, you know, competitors are getting into it because they recognize if you're not prepared, and that's what this whole conference is about being prepared for the future. If you're not prepared, then you look at what do I need today, then you won't be ready for tomorrow. If you're not looking ahead and preparing for tomorrow today, then you're going to be in trouble. I don't know where I'm supposed to point this at, but it's obviously not there. Does someone else have control? Okay. Okay, one of the things that now it's going all kinds of bad. Uh, you know, the other thing that we're looking at is something that people hadn't talked about, but we're thinking a lot about, is what will shopping be like in 2020? One of the things that we're looking at is eBay uh, has opened a store in London. Basically what the store is, is the store allows people to come in, look, touch, and feel, and then they purchase using a smartphone with the QR code. It blends the brick and mortar and the e-commerce world to give the best of both worlds. And in some ways, isn't that what showrooming is all about? People still want to be able to touch, feel, connect, <coughs> and touch, feel the product and make sure that it's what they want, but yet they don't necessarily need to come home with it. So what does that say? Well, less space. In this, in this case, they did it downtown uh, people didn't have to take the product home with them, but yet they felt better about their purchase in the end. So it's a blend. That certainly could increase e-commerce, if especially in technical areas and areas where people are concerned about what they're able to buy online, changes and evolves. The other thing that uh, we're looking at is how will purchases take place? What will drive it? What is the marketing behind it? Jimmy touched on this a little bit, but I think this is real important, is we today look at our, our, our mail, and a lot of our business is still for the brick and mortar stores. What are we doing to drive people into a store? One of our paradigms that has to change is 
What, what do we need to do to drive them online? That's a completely different problem that you have to address. And one of the parts, and one of the things that we're working hard on is, as Jimmy talked about, how do we move people from a hard copy mail piece online seamlessly? How do you make them want to take that phone out of their, po their pocket? And you know, this is an interesting uh, article that was in the Wall Street Journal. And basically, how it, ta it talked about how JCPenney is bringing back the catalog and how we're seeing catalog growth. And basically, it said, you know, one of the things that they realized was that 31% of shoppers have a catalog in hand when they go to purchase online. That's a driver online. And then when you, and when you think of the fact that now over 50% of all catalogs have QR codes, which are also to drive online, you can think about how mail is changing and how mail is changing in order to meet the world, the e-commerce world, and how that's that's moving. So they really don't like my presentation. <laughs> And now I'm back to collaborating. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll have to do this from memory, but uh, you know, basically, what, what we're looking at is we're looking at a future where we blend all these needs in, into the future to offer the solutions that we want. And I think a big part of it, and one of the things that my slides were going to show, uh, was the need to offer the consumer choice and the need to give the end customer control of what's happening. We talked to everything from the safe location where we need to give somebody and what they want and how they want to receive a product to in the end, how do you give the customer control of where do they want to live? Because you know, that's one thing that I believe will change over the next three to four years is consumer choice. Consumer are gonna drive uh, how and who they want to deliver that package. They're going, to get, they're going to demand the choice. That's why one of the things that the Postal Service is doing is we're, we're developing more applications and more apps that are going to give the consumer the ability to be able to control their delivery. We already introduced MyUSPS.com, which allows the consumer to be able to see all the packages that are coming into them. Today, it already allows you to be able to set delivery instructions where you're able to tell the carrier where you want to deliver or if you want to deliver to a neighbor's house. But I think that's just the beginning. I think where you have to go is you have to think what the consumer wants. So I'd like to ask a question that you ask differently. And what is driving somebody to say to, to us, that they want it delivered in a in a uh, parcel locker. What's the real problem that they have? Well, in most cases, I think I think if you dug that down deep, is there's not a place for them to leave it. They don't feel secure about where the package is going. So the the real question isn't do they want a locker. The real question is that they want something changed. And so this is where we've got to figure out what is it that they want changed? Is it that they want a outdoor parcel locker or is it do they want someplace secure on their property or in their building where it could be located to change that paradigm where they no longer think of that as an insecure location or a place that they don't want to receive it but, as, but instead as a convenient option. So, all this is about consumer consumer control and consumer choice. And that's what our objective here is, is to give the consumer a the option. And it's about the options in the platforms that they're, they're looking at. We're already looking at the, the, I, the iWatch. Can, can we give my USPS.com on the iWatch? What platform and how are people going to interact and how do you need to deal with them and what's what situations uh, do you want to be able to offer the end consumer so that they're better able to control it? Additionally, we've got to face the fact the consumer is demanding more. I, 
every year it seems like, whether it's the NPF, I put a new slide up there, and every year it seems like it's changed. And what's changing the most is what customers are demanding for in days to deliver. Because now it's one day. 66% want one day delivery. I remember when I first started putting it out, it was three to five, and just make sure you tell me. And I, I just wanted to have the expectation set correctly. Now, if you ask the consumer, it's one day. But if you look at right next to one day, it's free. So what we need to do is look at these solutions, and we need to find as an industry how we can blend our systems, how together we can offer all our strengths to reach these solutions that the end customer needs in order to offer them a cost-effective way to be able to do that. And the other thing is we need to look at the industry and say, what is stopping us from expanding and getting more into e-commerce? Because today, 92% is offline versus 8% is online. Obviously, there's a lot of things that just won't be sold online. But 6.5% of the customers say that they won't even go online because of, they, because of returns. They don't like the experience. That's something us as shippers directly control. So how can we make these solutions that can help drive this differently? How can we bring pe more people into our network because we've offered solutions to make it easy? And it's pretty, pretty simple. Well, first, for a small business, well, maybe we make it easier. Maybe we make tools that they can readily download that are now APIs. That's something that we've already done. Maybe we make the return label easier. Maybe someone doesn't even need to uh, put a return label on. Maybe they just put it back in the box and put it on the step. And because we have all the information on it and the barcode can be used either way, we can now just use that to get it back to the customer and the person that received the package doesn't even have to think, just put it back in there, take it back out, put it on your doorstep, and the shipping label acts as a round of trip label. You know, what, 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 how would we do bill? Well, it's pretty simple. Now we have scales on our sorters, uh, we have scanners, we build, the, we build the end receiver on when it's coming back based on that information. So how, if we can think about solutions that can drive cost and drive time out of it, this is where I think we take these big bang disruptors and we, add a little, we make it farther away from somebody entering our space and causing, and causing that disruption in the first place. So if I look for the need to speak, a couple of things that we're doing, uh, we've now done Sunday delivery. That's all about, that's even changing the paradigm. Nobody even counts. They, I can't even figure out how people count days uh, to ship it. It's always, don't count the weekend, but count Friday, count Saturday, unless it's after a certain amount of time, then it doesn't. Well, I don't think the end consumer is thinking that way. The end consumer thinks it's seven days a week. If I buy it and I want it next day, well, that probably means Sunday if it's a Saturday. Probably means Saturday if it's a Friday. So rather than thinking, how can we contract the days, Let's look at what the consumer needs and see if we can't offer them that. Let's see what we can do with same day. Let's see how quickly we can get there, but let's rethink the paradigm of same day. If I asked everybody in this room what same day means, I don't think anybody would say it means a cheaper alternative. If we stop thinking that way, maybe we can start to think of something that will truly shake up the marketplace. So not always asking the ordinary question, asking the, the questions uh, and trying to think of what things might be like three, four, five years down the road and how not just the post has changed, but the environment has changed, retailers have changed, the way they do business have changed. That probably gets us a better idea of where we should be thinking of going. And then of course, don't think about uh, delivery as just what you've always done. What more is it going to be? What else can you take advantage of? And we know groceries is just one alternative, but uh, but if we're moving forward. Uh, we've got a lot of interest in expanding this.
But what we're trying to ask ourselves is, what are the new markets? And where else can we go? So uh, with that said, I'll turn it back over to John, and we can hit us with any questions Thank he has. I have some of my own, but I'm not going to ask them now. I want to I want the hands of the audience. So who has some questions? I see way, way in the back there. There we go. Great. Hey, Thank um, you, Catherine. First of all, I'm really excited could, to hear could about you. Let us know who you are. Oh, sure. I'm Karen Morris with Bell and Howell. Um, I'm actually kind of new to the industry, about two years, came from wireless. But I'm really excited to hear about what you're doing. Some of the things we came up with, you're already working on. How do you market this? How do you tell people what you're doing? Like social media and, I mean, I, I don't think consumers know what you're doing. No, I, I absolutely agree with you. That's one of the things that, uh, that we're working on. And some of our launches have been, at this point, uh, we did do what we call soft launches at first. So some of the things like the myusbs.com app, we put that, we made that available on our website, but it's kind of been a soft launch to get reception, to adapt the, the website, and to make sure it's capable of being able to handle uh, what, we're, what we want to do in, into the future. So you'll actually be seeing a lot more marketing on that in the, in the next few months. So um, we deal with our marketing department a lot of this, and this is where I see things changing. A lot of, a lot of what we deal with is uh, marketed to the end shipper, to the large businesses, which ends up going through our sales department uh, where we're talking to it. But as I stated here, I think that's changing. I think your question is very relevant because that's a question that, that we're talking about. I think as a consumer now is demanding more and definitely feel like the consumer is going to have more say in the shipping, we've got to change that from thinking of just the, cons the shipper as our customer, but also as a person that's receiving it as a customer. And then how do we let them know the innovations that we're seeing and where we're going and to make sure that they know that we're going to be there for them and to be able to do it. So I think you're bringing up a very relevant question, but I think everyone in the shipping industry needs to look at that is who do we see as our customer? Because uh, it absolutely still needs to be the shipper, but we need to do a better job of now looking and saying, you know what, the consumer's the one that's probably going to be driving this in two to three years, a lot of the shipper choice. So we better be marketing to them as well. And we better be making sure that they understand everything that we can do for them and why, if I'm trying to get them to buy my product, how I'm differentiated from maybe my competitors or the new upstarts or the big bang disruption that, that uh, Brody's talking about. Gary, if, if I can expand on that, actually, I love Gary. Uh, oh, sure. Uh, <laughs> I think, it, just, just to comment, one of, one of the interesting things around what Karen was saying was consumers not understanding the breadth of what you, you have um, to offer. And just coming from some of the, the focus group research we did around the country, it was the same idea. People were pitching ideas that you guys already do, like what if the postal service picked up a package at my house, right? Different different things that uh, like that. And I think one of the challenges if, if we when we ask when we ask consumers, uh, would you be impacted if the postal service did not exist in five years? Well, everybody but two people said yes. One was Mary, who's 93, and said she'd be dead. <laughs> uh, but but on the on the on the other side, they couldn't quantify why they'd be impacted. And I think I think that's the thing is it's a part it's a part of our lives, but at the same time, it's tough for the, the average, it's been so, so ingrained and we know it for one very specific need, delivery, that we haven't thought about the other ways the postal service can support us. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we do is a lot of research as we're trying some of these new pilots. And, you know, one of the pilots we're doing is literally in Northern Virginia, allowing people to see their mail before, before they receive it just to see if that's something that they're interested in. And we're also making that mail interactive so it can go and go directly to a website and so forth. And one of my favorite comments uh, that we got from that was, I didn't even know I needed this till I got it. Yeah. And you know, it's that type of comment 
that I think is uh, is really what we're looking for in being leading edge. But the other thing that I think you bring up, which is a very important point, is some of the things that we're moving on from, which was maybe a policy or something that we were thinking of a year or two ago, where our thinking has changed with the times, that the perception is we're still looking at that, or we're still what we're still thinking, you know, how can we downsize, how can we centralize? And really what we're trying to think of is what does the consumer truly need? And then how do we adjust and make sure that people understand that's really where our mindset is now, is going out there reassessing in some cases what the consumer wants, but also I never like it asking a closed-end question like, do you like, and I use the example when I talked about, do you like a parcel locker, would you like to a parcel locker? Because I want to know what their problem is. Because I, if I ask them that, well, I know if that isn't really what is truly causing their dissatisfaction, then somebody can beat me to that next step. And by the time I get that parcel locker out there because it did solve their problem, there's a better solution. To their problem that somebody else will come with. So I think understanding the reasons behind these disruptions and understanding what technology is going to be behind these disruptions really <coughs> leads our thinking. And I think uh, you know I, I agree it's important for people to understand that and understand where we're going. <coughs> I have one question for for Gary and maybe maybe carriers who are represented here. Is is the way I look at this over the past several years? So much of this has been driven by Amazon, and um, uh, in fact, I've taken my slides out already about viewing on that. But I mean, Amazon came on 20 years ago. That's a long time in this industry. But then all of a sudden, you could buy books in any book you wanted, and it was cheaper, and it put Barnes and Noble out of business, and and uh, and then you could buy anything you wanted at any time, and and uh, it, it really drove so much of this trend. And 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 in following, I think in Jeff Bezos's belief that and, 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 and Sam Walton and always going for that lower, slowest, lowest price. In fact, he, the story is he wanted to name the company initially Relentless. This relentless pursuit of, of driving that price all the way down, and now all the way down through the value chain. Um, most of this, and all of it so far, has really enabled the customer, I think, empowered the customer with, with so much more power. But when it comes way down to the end, and, and we think the consumer has the power, they still don't have the power, you mentioned it, the choice of how they get their goods, how they get their hands on their goods. And what I mean by that is we're moving to the choice of having options of where we buy it. But what about what if they don't want it delivered by you? <laughs> or what if they don't want it by, delivered by UPS? And they don't, are they ever going to have any choice in that matter? Because when they, that choice is made by the, by the shipper, the merchant, not by the consumer. And I just wonder how that will, you know, will, will Amazon really ultimately be the ultimate controller, or will the consumer actually ever really get control? Well, what's Amazon trying to do? They're trying to please the consumer. They try, and where the postal service or another shipper is able to, to affect this is Amazon's customers will tell them if they have a preferred choice. Take, for example, uh, parcel lockers. They have a convenient place to receive the package uh, from one shipper, but yet not from the other shippers. That's going to make a difference. You don't think that they're going to communicate back to the end seller that this is not convenient for me, what you're doing, I need you to change. Well, that's what it's all about, is they they have a voice, and their voice is they need to go to the end seller, to the e-commerce market, to the store, to the new solution, or they don't. And, you know, through this, and through any good company wanting to please the end consumer, they have that voice. Because with this difference, there's, there's the ability to speak. Because I still think there's two main things that drive people uh, in the shipping world. It's free shipping and days to deliver. The problem that you have is that the expectations have now been commoditized. And when that comes to case, that's almost the expected. Now, what's a measure is what are these things that can differentiate? 
And if you're fulfilling this, but can differentiate yourself in a way that appeals to the end consumer, they'll want that. And that will be the way that they'll lead to, that they'll be uh, expressing their voice to the merchant. I'll just pile on here a second. As I look at the, on the retail side, Google probably be more better than this. Yeah, what we're seeing in Beth from an omnichannel perspective is that enabling the consumer, right? Click and collect, and online inventory, ship from the store, ship to the store, that sort of thing. Yeah, it's not hard to envision a couple of years from now where there's this uh, 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 almost a flip of the paradigm, where instead of the, I order something and the sender figures out how to get it to me. I order something and I say, tell me where it is and I'll figure that out. And I'll, I'll take control of that experience. And sometimes I'll go to the store and get it. Sometimes I'll have it shipped from the store. And USPS is the, you know, the perfect player there because nobody's better at local, especially hyper-local, than, than, their, than their network. And sometimes I might say, you know, ship it to the store and I'll send an Uber to get it. But whatever that model looks like, I think, uh, I think it's, it's not hard to envision that power should be to the consumer with what some of the trends that we're seeing in retail today. And I would just add something there that, you know, I think that one of the advantages that Amazon has here is that it's, it's able to act as this one part retailer and one part logistics company. So it is shrinking this last month. So a couple of weeks ago, Amazon filed a patent to basically create 3D uh, warehouse manufacturers on wheels. So it's this convergence of using 3D printing to start building products on demand while it's already on the way to meet the consumer. So Amazon has this ability to reduce this last mile. I think that's really the advantage they have. Great, great, great answers, I think. That was fantastic. Um, anybody else on this? We're gonna move in. This is, this is really going well, I think, because um, we posed a lot of problems. Uh, there seems to be a lot of uh, belief in the, Movement down the value chain to the consumer. We're definitely John. John's is still here. Hegel, we've been listening about the uh, uh, pull, the power of pull. I think we're all feeling it, and uh, a little anxiety about that in terms of being the suppliers of the services along the way to how to beat that and keep pace with it. But so we do have some of those solutions there. So if we could just quickly move into the next session. Can I just um, put a quick plug in for uh, the real mail notification project that Gary talked about? The image of your mail pieces before you get it, and not knowing that you need it until you need it. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we were my wife and I were on a weekend getaway. Son's grades arrived. I get the, uh, the uh, on my phone the uh, notification that they're there, uh, but they worked there miraculously. So he, I might not have known, but he definitely didn't know that I needed that from. <laughs> Great. Listen, thank you. This is wonderful. Thank you. We need uh, Kiba and uh, Swamp Lives. Uh, <laughs> oh, go uh, no, out. No. <laughs> Break since just a chance over on the team. Let's go, guys, please. Yeah. Um, while we do this, uh, um, uh, while we do this, we have uh, there was there was. I won't do anything. Okay. Uh, okay. There's one of the two one. Okay. If everybody could uh, be with us here for a second. Uh, we uh, we talked about a couple things that were on our early agenda that we were not really going to cover, but it's been coming up. We've been 3D printing and drones, and uh, uh, Ole Nordoff from... Uh,
for that. And, uh, and, and thinks it's, uh, it's not going to happen, I do. But uh, we just want to show a little, uh, little video here of, uh, of, uh, of the near future. Uh, go ahead, roll it. I, I think we can make it, right? Just stay calm and move as quietly as possible. Everyone understand? No sudden movements. Answer to Volvo and the deal they're working with DHL right now uh, to uh, to allow uh, deliveries to uh, car boots. I don't know if you know about that, but that's another thing DHL is working on. Um, whereby, truly, with uh, in a manufacturing agreements with Volvo, that um, they uh, uh, you can you can have a parcel delivered right to their, their car wash park in the office or something. Like that. Uh, they were working a lot of new things. That was obviously Audi, and uh, they don't like Volvo. Um, this is uh, just, I, I have eliminated a, a good bit to try to catch up on slides, but this is just something, another way that we're looking at this, and I have happened to tend to believe that that, uh, that uh, delivery is getting consumers' hands on uh, the actual goods is the missing link in this value chain. And uh, and they have control of just about everything all the way along the way, but that's that's where uh, that's we still have the challenge. And we have a number of speakers here who are going to talk about that, that uh, meeting that challenge. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Hannes Gaines from uh, Kiba and um, Neil Murthy from uh, Swapbox and Ramesh Rathan from Bell and & Howe. And I think we'll begin first with Hannes who's with uh, Kiba and you'll tell who Kiba is, but Hannes is new to Kiba and we've had Kiba here before, Walter and uh, Martin were with us a year or so ago. And um, I won't, if you don't know who Kiba is, I'll just let Hannes tell you. And, uh, and I will say this, and one other interesting thing about um, uh, parcel lockers. It came up yesterday in an OIG PIP uh, session where uh, I think it was uh, Brody who actually uh, drew some data that suggested that there was strong inclination for people to want locker boxes and want choices in that regard. And, uh, and I think um, we saw some other data that was like 30%. Then we heard from Europeans that this was like 50% in some markets. Already. And uh, Miguel Manabe from the uh, USPS uh, CMO was skeptical about that. And uh, that those numbers would be so high. Well, I think large, largely that's the point in the, this country. We don't have locker boxes, or we have very few. Um, and in Germany, we have well over 3,000. So uh, in some cases, it may not be necessarily that you want an alternative until you know there's an alternative there. And, uh, and therefore, I think that our country, again, is very much behind a lot of the rest of the world and posts in this, in, in this progression. And, uh, and locker boxes is probably. Uh, definitely coming our way, not, not like the drones, but in a more friendly way. And there will be a lot of options. So, uh, Hans, would you tell us about the Kiva's approach? Okay, hello, folks. Good afternoon. Um, today, I want to tell you a little bit about Kiva, who we are, where we're coming from, um, and what our solution is that we can offer to contribute to your last night challenge you might face. Um, Global commerce, e commerce is growing uh, exponentially. Okay, so Kiva is a privately owned Austrian enterprise founded in 68. It's a strong focus on automation, banking, and logistic self service solutions. <laughs> and since the beginning, Kiva is growing fast. And today we have uh, 11 subsidiaries around the world. We have approximately 1,000 employees, and we invest a lot in research and develop, development. Uh, since 1998, almost 17 years now, we are in the North American country, 
and we offer our solutions for international social organizations and for the automation industry uh, to raise some focus on logistic solutions. What is our solution in detail? What is KIPO? That's how we call our solution. KIPO is a point of logistics. And it is a fully modular, 24-7 self-service parcel logger system for, for, uh, for picking up packages, for dropping off returns, or shipping out packages. The solution is totally customizable and can be tailored to your specific use case or business case, supporting an easy integration uh, to your backend and to your payment or track and trace uh, services. The hardware is extremely reliable and very sustainable and fulfill uh, the required EDA requirements for an automated company. Actually, the picture you see on the right middle of the slide, it's not a fake picture, it's a, it's a real installation and the lock is still working even under the harshest conditions. Um, besides the convenience of a parcel of picking up a pack package, um, you might also see about offering additional services directly at the locker. Like you want to accept returns from your clients, you want to give them the possibility to buy a label and ship out a package at the locker. I think that's one of the key success factors um, for every business case and get guarantee satisfied clients by saving enormous amounts on your last mile costs. On the next slides, I'm going through it. So three case studies I want to share with you, um, and I talk about success factors. There's many critical success factors when you think about implementing an automated uh, intelligent locker system. Uh, but for me, one of the most critical success factors is marketing and the integration, strong integration, deep integration into online shopping platforms. Uh, I think. Marketing is more important than picking the right side. The first case I would like to present today is uh, about Post Denmark. Um, they really understand the importance of marketing and advertising and the use of social media and how those uh, actions help to get people's attention for their lockers. It's actually my favorite spot and it's been released uh, during the holidays. So, Brian, you can just start spot, please. Thank you. So, I mean, it's a nice experience. Um, I would have loved to have this um, kind of um, Santa Claus experience when I was a kid, but yeah. Uh, there's another story I tell you a little bit about, and I'm going to refer to the Christmas thing in my next, uh, next or to the last case study. So, but post Denmark, I'm sorry, post Denmark they started in 2007 with the rollout of their rollout, and at the day they had about 500 operating units in Denmark. Uh, so what they can't if you look at the size of Denmark on the map, and I'm, I live in Texas, and in Texas people tend to say everything is bigger in Texas. <laughs> so I Google, I Google the size of Denmark and yeah, and try to, to look up how many times it could fit in Texas. What do you think? The idea is it's about 16 times, one six. So 16 times um, and five times in terms of population. So just imagine how many lockers people have in Texas, just um, one of those numbers. So our uh, Denmark was really, their goal was uh, offering convenient shopping and pickup, more than pickup um, experience for their clients. They wanted to secure their market share in the past business. And they saw also a huge cost savings on the last month. 
it's actually one of the most utilized networks we've seen so far. Um, we're talking about numbers about 60% of their departments are utilized 24 7 hours. And that's pretty much the max you can get out of the walking walk network, actually. So it's pretty good, and they've done a great job. Um, and part of it is marketing. And they already knew that marketing is key, so they delivered the first pack, the first locking systems actually in the heart of Copenhagen. Um, well, as a packet, so they got people to actually write, write uh, from the beginning. The next use case is one of, client, of our biggest clients. This is um, DHL German Post. They call their, their service Packstation or Pack Station in the US. And I want to play that spot um, because it's addressing a totally different, but very state of the art issue with faith delivery pen. And the left delivery node, and how inconvenient that is for your clients. Brian, <coughs> thank you. Nicht zu Hause, wenn ihr Paket abnimmt. DHL hat die Lösung. Die Packstation. Schon Zeit und Nerven. Sobald Ihr Paket angekommen ist, werden Sie per SMS oder E-Mail benachrichtigt und können die Sendung rund um die Uhr abholen oder selbst Pakete aufgeben und dabei sogar bis 1,50 Euro Porto sparen. Melden Sie sich einfach unter packstation.de an und Weihnachten kann kommen. DHL Packstation. Bereits über 900 Mal in Deutschland. Well, so it's another good, again, another good marketing spot, I see. And um, so DJ and he was started in 2001 by developing their first uh, ultimate lock solution. And because they had around, they had about 2,700 locks installed in these 26 departments. And in 2013, they were able to deliver 30 million packages through the locker network. Um, besides cost savings on the last mile, which I've been told is about 42. 65% of the total shipping cost. Um, their overall goal was to gain market share and secure parts of business. But they also had another speciality they would like to mention is they want to provide uh, a lock that is in a 10 minute driving radius for 90% of the Germans. But that's pretty, it's a pretty, pretty, pretty cool goal actually. So it's been a great relationship with uh, DHL for the last 14 years and we had a lot of learnings on both sides. and. It wouldn't, have, it wouldn't be our product, or it wouldn't be that product we offer right now if we wouldn't have that relationship. Last but not least, I'd like to talk about our Austrian client, the Post Austria. They started, also started in 2008. In 2008, 2007 was kind of when this whole locker, intelligent locker, ultimate locker network scene started and took off in Europe. So they started in 2008, they have 110 lockers installed so far. It's an already confirmed plan to expand to 400 lockers. And they were strong sales service lobby. And what they, what they did is they re phased, remodeled the whole corporate store concept. So they're offering 24 7 sales service zones, including all posted services you can imagine. We're talking about post, um, we're talking about mail, we're talking about uh, uh, stamp kiosks. We also talk about uh, locker networks and parcel. Uh, packages picking up at the self service zone and some other additional services they offer. So they are they have a successful cooperation with the Austrian Petal Company, which actually allows them to go further um, with the installations to actually eventually get to the foreign block of the store. So there's more examples of successful implemented. Um, case studies and success stories so far. Um, but what makes it so interesting from a business development and sales point of view is that every country, every use case, every scenario is, is totally different. And you, you cannot just copy and paste everything, right? You cannot just copy and paste the Austrian solution. So, yes, from work, it has different um, requirements. People are used to do, you get the package delivered, right? You get the package delivered to our doorstep, more or less. And it's, it's probably it's about convenience, probably not. It's probably more about the uh, cost savings in the last mile or offering additional services at the lock to get people's um, attention 
and, and streamline and focus on the last mile delivery. So that's really made for use cases and scenarios, but important is to understand um, that there's also a solution that can pretty much customize everything, whether it's hardware or software. So what is our what is our USP? What is what is our value proposition? Yeah, I mean, since 15 years, since 14 years, we are on the market. We are, we are solution innovators together with DHL. We are holding worldwide patents. Uh, we have proven use cases around the globe, and every product in our factory um, undergoes to be a testing, whether it's hardware or software, to fulfill high quality standards. Because of our modular concept and full support lifecycle management, we easily fulfill <coughs> and exceed your requirements for investment protection. Our solution um, is, is on the market since years, and we fulfill standards like EDA for the, for the North American market. Even the, the governmental um, agencies is 5 EDA um, is totally covered with our solution. So because of that experience, um, I'm really happy to um, give you the opportunity and guide you and help you understand the critical success factors to implement a lock network and being successful by the next step uh, to overcome this um, huge e-commerce past business growing volume. It's, I mean, you cannot adding, you cannot ending up adding drugs on the street, right? And that's not going to happen in the next five or ten years. That's going to cause serious issues. So. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, that's actually all this we can bring in and I'm at the end of my slides. Mm -hmm. uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Um, we passed around a few cards, so it's, uh, it's, it's a little too deep article and would like to invite you guys to stop by at our, our booths outside. We have brought a little room for you to touch and speak to get your personal package deal today and see how it works. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hannes. Um, we have a slightly different approach coming from uh, Silicon Valley, uh, and as we say, we don't we don't have many lockers in this country, and yet uh, maybe if we did, uh, people would use them more. And I think we're we're learning a lot about choice and um, and receptivity in in, in the uh, in the case of Germany and uh, uh, in these other countries. Lockers have been uh, the business has been driven primarily by the carrier. I think is a matter of convenience for customers, but obviously cost reduction for missed deliveries. And then they found that people find them convenient. They tend to come there and, and choose uh, pickup to <laughs> the uh, Whether that happens here is another question, but um, uh, what uh, Neil's going to tell us about is another approach to uh, getting lockers installed uh, as opposed to having them be driven by a carrier to do so. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, so yeah, we're we're the new kids on the block. Um, we came about about two and a half years ago, uh, and Swap is still only in San Francisco right now, which is probably why a lot of you have not heard about us. Um, and, and our approach is different. We started with this notion that um, that, that we wanted to not necessarily disrupt the space, as, as we talked about earlier um, in Silicon Valley. Like you, you learn this concept that everything should be disrupted. Talked about the big bang disruption. We actually decided we don't want to disrupt something. We want to provide a new interface for people, for the end consumers, to interact with services that already exist and already have value. Um, so originally, we actually just wanted to fix last mile delivery. I'll talk about it. Um, but we recently also decided to um, have a new, new take on first mile delivery as well. Um, again, you can see that my, my slides are really long. So we, you can follow along. But I, I do have copies if you need them. But what came about was actually, we, we actually didn't start out with the concept of, of wanting to build lockers. We started out trying to figure out what the solution was to, to the problem, which was people needed a convenient way to get packages. And what happened was lockers became that solution um, after a couple tests and experiments. Uh, and, and it's worked really well for, for our markets and, and what we're doing so far. Um, and I'll get into some of that stuff. Uh, but as, as you can see, we started with something even worse than the picture I put up there. It was so bad that we I didn't want to put a picture up there. It was essentially like a gym locker from high school with touchscreen on the front. Um, and we ran electronic locks. Um, it, was, it was bad news. 
Um, but we came from that first prototype to, to where we are now, which was um, the swap box, as you see. And, and it became something that, um, in the US at least, we designed it before people necessarily knew that they wanted it. And it became, um, it became a concept that people latched onto because it solved that convenience factor. It solved that problem for them, which is they're not at home when, they, when the delivery is there. And so we, we latched onto that concept and based on sort of consumer demand, we also launched a product where, well, now that um, there's, there's some issues with getting the post office on time, you can send packages without having to be there. You can essentially drop off your item in a swap box and it can go out in the background using carriers that people trust because there is value in the brand names, right? They're, they're essentially being able to access these brands that they couldn't before. Um, and so Swapbox really just wanted to provide that interface. Um, and, and the bigger reason I think that we came up with Swapbox and, and the concept existed was that um, e-commerce e is really changing. So uh, I think the, the product in the US that most of you are familiar with is the Amazon Locker. That, that's sort of what sort of spurned the business here and what has, um, change the model for, for at least from the from the e-commerce, from the retail front, you see Amazon driving a lot of this um, innovation. Not to say that you know UPS, USPS, FedEx haven't done their own sort of programs for this last mile delivery, but I think what Amazon did really made this be an intention point for, for the retailers. Um, but the reason that this market is sort of at its nascency in the US and, and is growing is because we, we have this move towards what a lot of the speakers were saying before, um, different forms of e-commerce, you have same day deliveries growing, you have people having this new need that they didn't necessarily know that they had before. Um, and and we are now more connected. We Like, like was said before, we, we can do this with flip phones, but now that we everyone has a smart device, you can do a lot and you can, uh, um, you can get to your customer in different ways. So I kind of wanted to take a little bit of time to just talk about what we're seeing in e-commerce and how um, there's space for a locker installation in the US that's not Amazon, um, because while they have the capital and the, and the drive to install units, um, because of, this is their last mile UX that they want to sort of uh, prevent people, there is a growing sort of cohort of other e-commerce companies, some that are already established, like the bigger players like eBay and Etsy, who, who we're talking to, but a lot of sort of new ways of doing to e-commerce. Um, one of the cool examples actually that uh, we see a lot of um, in, in the Valley that, that maybe isn't as prevalent because Google is starting to roll it out, uh, is, is Google Shopping Express. So we talked about same day delivery um, and Google Shopping Express is essentially buying, it, it is essentially buying from these retailers uh, the brick and mortar stores, but it, getting it delivered to your home. Now, the problem is they uh, have to have a four hour delivery window because you have a, um, a sort of same day issue, right? Where you, you're having problems getting all the information to how, how soon you can get something to someone's home. Uh, but with Swapbox, what we were able to do is partner with Google Shopping Express guys and say, no, you, you as a customer don't need to be home for a four hour window. You can actually just get something sent to a swap box, still use that same day power, but now you have the convenience factor of being able to pick up um, on your own schedule. And that's been pretty powerful because we can combine the two sort of convenience factors. Uh, there's, there's others sort of that, that we're seeing that are coming about that are essentially splintering away um, at the sort of e-commerce behemoth that you see in Amazon and, and some of the incumbents. Um, and it's what I think, you, people may not agree, but I think um, they're going to be some of these companies chipping away at, at what is the sort of um, norm for e-commerce. But you have, um, you have again, outside of same-day shipping, which, which people are sort of in contention about, you have two-day shipping, which Amazon dealt with with Prime, that's becoming even more prevalent. You have ShopRunner that has basically allowed all these other um, retailers to get into the game and provide that same two-day shipping. Um, and as we saw, that's, that's what customers want, is they want faster and faster um, and more and more convenience. Um, but you, there's also sort of like other, there's there's other industries that are being impacted by this, which I think relate back to this sort of logistics play that we're talking about. Um, you have your food delivery, which is which is growing. You, um, well, most people have seen, um, you know, the Grubhubs and the Seamless as a little that are, delivering actual food from the restaurants to your homes. But there's also um, this essentially like gifting market that's changing as well. Um, so there's, there's a company out in San Francisco called Gold Belly, 
which basically takes the best food from around the country and they get it shipped to your home. Um, so you, you're not in um, Buffalo, New York, but you can get the original Buffalo wings from, from Anchor Bar. Um, and it's it's um, kind of changing the way people are, people are eating the food, at least in, in markets that Whole Belly operates in. Um, but now you have the problem of how do you get that food, which is refrigerated or frozen in the case of ice cream, to someone um, at their end point. You have delivery networks that can deliver that, but in urban markets, you're having people that are running into that issue of, okay, now you have a pie that's sitting in front of your house and we'll go back in a couple days, but now, now what happens when you can't get it? Or you have people stealing your food and no one wants you know, your pie that you paid for if you stole it. Um, and then even more sort of removed out of, out of e-commerce is something like an Airbnb, um, which changes the way people are, are staying and experiencing um, travel. Uh, but now you you have a, an address that isn't necessarily you're you're traveling more you're staying at a location that isn't your home. Um, what do you do when you don't have a permanent address that you can access? Um, and that's that's growing. And yes, in a hotel you have a reception that can get the package for you. But if you're staying in an Airbnb, um, one you may not want to get a package into someone else's home, but you may have an apartment complex uh, or a condo complex that can't receive that package for you. Um, so because of the way things are changing, we at 12 Box felt like there was a, a different way that people need to interact with these services. Um, and I'll talk about one that's uh, not what we're doing right now, but kind of elucidates what we want to do in the future, which is this company called iTrack, which essentially gets your iDevice prepared um, when you're not actually wanting to go to the Genius Bar. Um, it's something that I, I hate doing. Um, and a lot of people do, obviously, because iTrack is doing really well. But you still have to have that interface where you meet up with a courier to pick up your phone and then coordinate with them to drop off the device, right? There's still a friction point that isn't solved yet. Um, and, and so one of the things that we talked to them about is what if you could drop off your phone in the swap box and then while you're at work, it gets prepared asynchronously, you come home from work and now you have a fully working iPhone without having to ever step into that. Um, so there's there's some power to a network that you can build that allows you to interact with these services asynchronously, um, especially with the changing phase of e-commerce. So that's that's really where we're going. And and while we are new in San Francisco, we we are doing pretty well. We've grown to about 22 kiosks right now. We've partnerships with some of the retail establishments because our contention was that people really need that hour of operation uh, flexibility because that is the convenience point. Is that you can walk into your grocery store the safe way. Um, and pick up a package or drop a package off and be able to interact with USPS without actually having to go um, to, to a post office when the hours aren't convenient for you. Um, now that isn't to say that we'll necessarily replace that in user interface because for people that can work with the post office's hours, it's probably a, a, a medium that they already work with. But for people that can't access that network because they're not around during that time frame, um, they can now buy into that same network by just using the swap box asynchronously. Um, and that's that's really the power. So we, we play sort of in the red box space. Um, the the former president of Redbox is one of our advisors and investors. So it's it's kind of the um, the model that we're going after is as, as we have this available space, what do you do with it, and, and how do you uh, get to the customer in the most effective way? Um, but yeah, I, I think that just gives you an overview, uh, and, and I'll sort of move on and, and let other people talk and then we can get into questions. Thank you, Neil. <laughs> we along quickly, which is wonderful because we have a break and then we have another workshop later on. Uh, but uh, so now I'd like to introduce from Extra Time, who was with us a couple of years ago <clears throat> uh, with a different employer. Four years ago. Four or five years ago. Uh, no, the first one, yeah, that's right. <clears throat> and that uh, was the first one. We had uh, Penny Bose at the time, and Ramesh is the new CEO uh, a year or so at Bell uh, Howe. And, um, and has, in particular, one really interesting approach uh, that, that gets to the value chain and one of the issues that uh, exist around dim waiting and some other things that I'll like to So I think, yeah, some of you will remember that I was here five years ago. And uh, some of my old colleagues from Brittany Bose are here. The last time I was here, I was on the podium representing Brittany Bose as president of the DMT business and we uh, presented Molly. It was going to be the digital mailbox and the digital postal service that was going to replace everything you guys do. Um, didn't quite work out that way. <laughs> right. Some of you know that uh, I spent the first 15 years of my life in a place called Bell Labs. Um, 
trying to figure out how to do physical things and digital networks, and we used to worry about increasing the bandwidth of the last mile. And, and we used to be very <laughs> jealous about this other network that had what we believe was the broadest bandwidth, which happened to be the Postal Service, the Postal Service person. So you can't beat that kind of bandwidth. <laughs> By the way, it's still true. Um, so uh, today I wanted to share with you, actually, I'm going to talk about one thing, but I have a long-winded way of getting there. So I've got three or four slides that, that preceded, and I want to kind of get through that real fast. But it's really about what's happening to the postal industry, um, part that we've been serving, and, and, and the fact that what we observe is a, a shift overall from communications to commerce, or in the physical world, from mail to parcels. So, so I don't need to repeat all of this. You've heard this from a lot of speakers today. You know, transactional first class mail going down three to five percent. Direct marketing mail stable, actually increasing in places. Um, interesting thing about posts and liberalization or privatization. People think it's a European phenomenon, but you know, most of us know that the U.S. Postal Service actually has been privatizing chunks of its network and capabilities for a long time, including. Uh, as I said yesterday, the invention of the pre-sort industry, the postal automation and work share discounts. Uh, and that continues to happen, but there are certain things that the postal service and the post will always be very, very good at. Part of it is very high bandwidth uh, network interface uh, for access and egress. Now, you know, there are other things happening, like, you know, the, the whole concept of increased personalized services to each home, um, concept of new kinds of last mile technologies, I love what these guys are doing. You know, so Neil, you know, if you think about preheated boxes for pizza or pre-cooled boxes for beer. You know, you kind of P two P kind of deliveries or, or person to person kind of deliveries. And of course, you know, we've talked about digital services. As I said, I was here the last time talking about you know volume digital mailboxes, and, and, and that's a struggle because it hasn't quite happened the way everyone predicted. Uh, it kind of is, is it's all about you know digitally enabling physical networks. Um, you can't quite physically enable digital networks. It doesn't quite work the other way around. So, so some of the things we're working on is, is actually going back to the basics of physical networks, real things that exchange hands, go from person to person or company to people, and what can we do to digitally enable that? Um, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm not going to spend any time on this, but, but this is a huge bread and butter of, of this 153 billion pieces that, that Jimmy Cochran was talking about earlier. This, continues to grow. It's a very important part of that. This is the part of the communications part of the physical network that's still you know, very strong. And, and I think actually technology enables that in many, many ways. You've heard many of our speakers today talk about things like the first baby steps of you know, QR codes, going from, from QR codes to, to more advanced things like adding data. Uh, and of course, in adding taking data and adding important things like location and addresses and a, I heard about this very interesting company, Charlie. You should—I don't know if you've talked to these guys called What Three Words? It's new ways of locating and identifying or geocoding addresses. Uh, and of course, everyone wants to talk about augmented reality. Now that we all have these little smartphones that do very high-definition video, and you can actually overlay data. And, and and of course, the important thing is taking all this digital technology and figuring out how to add it to paper or physical things. And of course, there's things like you know new kinds of substrates, being able to do active video on paper. Uh, which, by the way, is not that far away. Uh, and, but even doing things with paper itself, going back to the basics of what do you print, how do you print, do you use digital printing? Can you actually do interesting things with it? And you all heard me talk about changing the economics. And in the classic print and mail workflow, the, the fundamental economics gets changed by something we call white paper factory, which is no more, no more pre-made envelopes, no more pre-printed stock. You go from plain stock, digital printing, digital information, uh, complete what we call enveloping, what uh, others call wrapping, and then processing it completely automatically uh, and needed in very high secure environments like medical information, healthcare. Uh, but it actually changes the economics of how you do communications in the physical world, which kind of gets me to uh, the next one that I want to really talk about is, is that as all of this communication heads towards commerce, uh, you know, one of the main reasons I found this job very attractive in Bell & Hall was this little company called CMC that's had an exclusive relationship with Bell & Hall for a long time. And they were working on going from communications to commerce, parcels. And, and, and actually, um, they were trying to solve the kind of the two problems that, that we wound up solving that were kind of unanticipated. 
the main problems we were trying to solve is something that you've heard about a lot today, the speed. Uh, so for example, in Bell and Howell for a long time, we've had labeling technology. It goes back, Mike Swift will talk about it. That you know, goes back to when you get the little yellow stickers on your envelopes and change of address, very, very high speed labeling and printing systems that do that at many, many thousands per hour, much faster, you know, especially as you're flying through one of our sorters at 55,000 pieces an hour, very high speed stuff. In the classic parcels business, the speed at which people put objects in boxes, close them, glue them, label them, is what? The best is about 50 an hour. So we were looking to do 10x to 20x improvement on that. So we started to think about speed improvements. So how do you actually get to same day delivery, one hour delivery? It's by speeding the, the process, speeding the flow of workflow of products through the process of putting them into boxes and making these boxes and labeling them and shipping them. So, but we wound up solving two problems that were completely un unanticipated. I'll tell you about that after we see the video. Brian, can we run the video? I know, even the video is produced by engineers, so the sound effects aren't great. The carton wrap system uses sensors to determine length, width, and height of products. This data tells the system what size the carton should be. The carton is created from corrugated cardboard, either roll or fan fold, to fit the exact size needed. Scoring wheels automatically adjust based on dimension to ensure square folded edges. Feeders can be added to include invoices, packing slips, or other materials. Weighing and labeling modules can be added so that the finished carton is ready for entry into the transportation stream. The packages are unique and secure, each one sized to its contents. That, by the way, is a carton of eggs. Great run, thanks. So, so the two problems we solved, and, and you know, people in the industry see this, they go nuts because they thought we must have inside information about what UPS and FedEx is going to do with dim weight pricing. But that actually solves the dim weight pricing problem um, because you don't ship any air. You're basically sizing the uh, carton exactly to the object. You're doing three-dimensional scanning. You're going through a scan panel to figure out the exact dimensions of the object. You're building a carton around it that's exactly sized to it. You automatically are weighing it, sizing it. They're scanning it in so many ways that you can actually collect information on what's the object, if it's a cell phone, it's a serial number. So all the data and information about what's the object, what size it is, what the weight it is, what, where it's going, kind of goes into the network, so to speak, makes it very, very intelligent. But the second problem it solves, and then that's why I like what some of these guys are doing, especially people like Neil, is it, it actually solves a problem that I don't think there's an industry for yet. And, I, and, and some of us have talked about it, I believe it's going to be a big part of this industry and that is consumer to consumer parcels business. Um, think about you know having a post office you know, person walk up to your door and just handing them you know here's here's the socks I just made for grandma. Uh, and I'm not going to sit down and find a box and put it in. And having having a bunch of consumers give stuff to a carrier who'll pick it up and take it to a machine like this and put it in the network, all pre box, pre labeled, pre shipped. So so bottom line is is. Uh, you know, I, I think there's there's significant things happening in the last mile. We're working on things in the first mile. We're also looking at the last mile. 
And, and honestly, um, it, it, it basically comes back to, I, I think, in terms of my advice on the future of the posts and how to help the posts evolve, is it's, there's a huge movement, as I like to say, from, from investment in communications to investment in commerce. And really, it's about moving from a mail-focused, mail-oriented network to a parcels, packaging, and logistics-oriented network. And there's key technologies needed in there. Some of those key technologies sit in the first mile. Some sit in the network, by the way. Some sit in the last mile. And we're trying to figure out as well and how, how we can you know, help um, not just the shippers and mailers, but the, the carriers and the posts actually evolve along that. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Ramesh. Uh, no, it really is impressive uh, and, and obviously works towards reducing cost and, uh, and, and more efficiency in the whole supply chain and, and uh, eliminating extra paper and uh, space and all that sort of stuff. So it uh, looks, looks, looks cool. Is that available in the US? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, uh, we have an order for one in the US, Mike. Yeah, yeah Mike. We have a, it is available. We're, in, we're building it. Yeah. The way we've got the sold worldwide six at this point, I think two are in operation. These things like take a while to build. Yeah. Nine days. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, excellent. Well, uh, here are a few solutions that we're seeing on the uh, coming down the value chain. And uh, uh, I'd like to open up to questions. Two approaches on, uh, on uh, market boxes and, uh, and a packaging solution. And if we don't have any questions, uh, thank you, gentlemen, for moving so quickly along. We can take a quick break, and then we have some uh, some other really fascinating concepts and inventions coming up in the, in the last session before we have our work, last workshop. So let's take a quick break. Thank you.
Please take your seats. We're going to go here uh, with, our, with our next round. Thank you. Thank you. Chuck, can I see Chuck? Can you help us get people seated, please? You too. Yes, please, everybody. Okay. I'm going to introduce Charlie Prescott. Will everybody please take your seats? Somebody said they like the bass. It, it, it keeps them away from the iPhone things and uh, not checking email. Uh, so we, I'm glad because we, we, we have to keep the bass here. We have so much content and uh, limited time and we want to share it all. I'm very pleased next to present Charlie Prescott, again, a veteran of Postal Vision 2020 and clearly of this industry. Uh, Charlie is, uh, in fact, a, uh, a lawyer, uh, a Harvard lawyer, so he's, don't worry, be careful uh, what we say here. Um, and, uh, but he spent his career mostly in direct marketing and, uh, and uh, in, in fact, with the DMA and, and uh, Reader's Digest and also uh, uh, it is the is kind of the world's, in my view, uh, sort of address guru, and, and he's the guy who really cares about the fact that half the world or whatever the number is doesn't even have addresses. Um, so Charlie is the uh, founder and the chairman of uh, the Global Address Data Association, correct, Charlie? And also uh, is in frequent meetings at UPU, and I'm not sure what that's all about, but it's about addresses. And so I asked Charlie if he would be willing to chair this. Uh, this session, which does, deals with addressing uh, more than anything, uh, not so much payment, as it said, but, but clearly addressing and locating. And there's some really interesting stuff coming here that's coming from another place, not from within the industry, from without. And, and that stuff I love because it uh, uh, it shows fresh ideas and uh, and there are other other technologies that people recognize in this ecosystem and the opportunities to uh, to uh, uh, reinvent it and, uh, and, 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 and and recognize the opportunities here. So, so I'm going to introduce Charlie and let him introduce the rest of you. Thank you. Charlie? Let's give Charlie a hand. Uh, you stole my thunder. I can just sit and respond. Introduce me, especially being a, a lawyer. Um, Addressing and payment innovation, just a few words very quickly about addressing and payment. Uh, you may all know Rowland Hill. He is part of the reason that we have this industry, isn't he? Uh, uh, the brilliant uh, Englishman who uh, changed the way we pay for postage from receiver pays to center pays with the uh, penny black, one penny stamp issued in the UK and rapidly picked up by postal systems around the world. Uh, we still pay postage that way. And that's all we do with the postage stamp. And we have a proposal to do something much more dramatic, Marshall, uh, as, as another source of revenue. So payment is uh, an important part of the postal system. So is the address. That is a, a picture of a bridge over the Seine to um, Notre Dame. It was a very busy bridge because people would go to Notre Dame to attend services and pray. And of course, if there's a lot of foot traffic, you get a lot of merchants. And if you get a lot of merchants, you get a lot of tax collectors. And so the king said we'll have addresses on the shops uh, so that the tax collectors can be sure they get taxes from everyone. And thus, we think, began the street addressing system. 
which really hasn't changed much since then. And if you've been to Paris and seen the beautiful street signs and the numbers on the houses, the ceramic blue and white really became the global standard of what a street address should look like. But the street address has its shortcomings, and we have a couple of proposals on that. The address is pretty important. This is UPU data, and I'm afraid you probably can't see it very well. Take it from me that those circles and circle the countries who don't have official address data much below a village level or a town level. Those people are semi-excluded from e-commerce because there's no way to get a parcel to them, particularly safely, except with a descriptive ad address, which is 30, 30 yards south of the where the oak tree used to be, that kind of an address. Addresses are important, and uh, my association, the Global Address Data Association, has been working with the UPU. We're very proud to have helped come up with a competition, and one of our speakers today has uh, entered that competition, uh, but three words. This was an invitation to solve an addressing problem. We came up with five scenarios, and uh, actually uh, Richard Abbas here is here also. His company submitted a proposal. Those are being judged now. Different scenarios from the Ebola outbreak in the back, uh, back country where there are only footpaths, to a refugee camp, to uh, a, an island nation that has no streets, et cetera, et cetera. We received a, a large number of entries from around the world. Those have been judged, and those will be revealed and uh, along with a great deal of other work at an addressing conference at the UPU in October, that will be the first global addressing conference ever. Uh, and we hope to see uh, the developments that come out of that competition presented and more ideas about the address being put forth. For right now, let's start with that address proposal. Um, Chris has a fascinating background. He's not a postal guy. Uh, he came up with this idea principally because he managed bands. Now, if you manage musicians, you soon learn that you have to give them extremely explicit instructions on where to go and when. And if you've ever hung around a very large convention hall, you'll know there is no bloody way in hell you're going to find the place you're supposed to go unless they lead you by the hand. And so what three words was came about partially because of that background, and Chris will tell us more. Following Chris, uh, uh, unlike our program here, you'll hear from Sean. Sean isn't a postal guy either, but he was commissioned, uh, his firm was commissioned uh, as a design firm to come up with an idea uh, that would make a prettier stamp that could be of more use and that would serve as an address. Uh, the, the little background uh, on this design firm, SIBA, uh, one of the one of the clients is Disneyland, who and they design the experience that you and your children have had at Disneyland. So uh, completely out of the box for us, and I think it will be fascinating. Marshall Van Alstyne is an old veteran here with new ideas, and he will now undo much of the fine work that uh, Rowland Hill did and will make it even more profitable, I certainly hope, and he'll tell you about that. Joni Berenblatt is a coastal experts expert, it's who I uh, would go to for advice, and she has had some observations on mobile, uh, mobile phone and its use and its relationship to the coastal world, and she will have some very cogent uh, observations about what the other speakers will be telling us. And with that, let's uh, invite Chris up here to tell us about what three words. Good. Um, thank you very much, Charlie. Um, hi, everybody. I am Chris. I'm one of the founders of What Three Words, uh, a global addressing solution. And um, as Charlie said, I did not come from the logistics sector or from the geospatial sector or anything uh, at all related. I was from the music business. Um, and it's not that musicians are just particularly inept at getting to anywhere. Uh, I think what, what the problem with my life was that uh, all of the musicians and production companies we work with on a daily basis had to go somewhere new every single day. And it was never, if it, in the case of a convention center or a hotel, the main entrance, it was always uh, service entrance B. 
which doesn't actually have a conventional address. And um, the image I'm using here, Dubai in the UAE, is a pretty good example of most of the world which doesn't have an address system like we know it here. And when we were told it's the convention center and we said, okay, is there any more information? They said, oh yeah, of course there is. It's past Burger King's third lamppost on the left. And then you discover there's four Burger King's at the convention center and it goes on and on from there. Um, and, and this is just a bit of a dose of it. And you know, if you're dealing with logistics on a professional basis, as we were, um, time was money and time was reputation. And this was a really recurring problem every day that we struggled with. Um, I don't know how, how well you can see the actual detail on that map, but that's actually a Google Maps screenshot of Dubai with all of the road names it has in that area listed, um, which I think you can see is basically the one on the right. Uh, and there's three villas on the left. Um, and you know, when we went to places which were in these kind of areas, this was a really big problem um, to communicate the location. Um, and you know, away from the Dubai example, which people are often surprised about because it's a pretty affluent country, um, we were working in places uh, such as uh, Brazil and Nigeria, and a lot of places where uh, the address systems are really really bad um, as well and they're not even on the map so it's, it's extraordinary to a lot of people that actually about half the world do not have an address as we know it and it's a figure which i still struggle to get my head around but it is true um, and in this case of uh, Rio de Janeiro in brazil you can see that there's exactly the same place shown on google maps on map view as on satellite view and you can see this is a place where there's no, no maps, let alone no addresses. So you've got twice the battle that you like to actually get anything done. Um, and whilst work is being done by everybody who's trying to improve this on the map side, the addressing kind of gets left behind um, because it relies on the local governments. Um, it's not just drawing objects. Um, and talking about when I was in Nigeria, this is actually a screenshot of uh, Ghana, uh, where what happens in a lot of the countries where they're build building addresses, um, and it didn't happen to start with, they maybe start a pilot project and maybe then at that point the water board needs to come and do something and they actually give your house a different number to the one that your national addressing system pilot project has given you. So you end up being number 47 in one system and 13 on another. And uh, here's another screenshot again in Ghana. I mean, who, what address does this person actually have? Um, you know, every single person or, or authority that's needed to to uh, work with this house has given it a different location reference. So this makes it like very, very, very awkward. Um, and so this, uh, in, in the UK, we call it a sat-nav here, I guess it's a GPS device, but um, this is the problem that we think should be solved um, in the year 2015. Um, this is a screenshot from England, and you know, my mother lives uh, in an area where we have postcodes, but we only have house names, no house numbers. So it's impossible to have any kind of uh, context. So uh, for the 15 years we've lived next to a barbecue shop, um, she gets deliveries for that barbecue shop. And they use all of the major delivery companies to deliver, yet still, 15 years on, um, about two or three times a week, she will be pointing the delivery driver around the block, and this will be costing them five minutes, which you know, over 15 years is an inconsiderable amount of money. So this combined with my experience of traveling around the world, um, with musicians, um, we wanted to fix this, and you know, this is another example. If you type in Lonsdale Road, London, um, there are actually eight Lonsdale Roads in London, not the five that you get given. There's, there's an awful lot of hassle with addresses as we know it, um, and people have problems. So, I wanted to use something. You know, I was like, I'm going to be very tech savvy in my music business. We're going to abandon addresses in favour of GPS coordinates because. Not a lot of people know um, on a consumer level that you can put GPS coordinates into a device. You can find them, um, if you dig them out of a mapping app, you can put them into or have another app or a device and they will get you somewhere exactly centimetres if you would like it. So um, we started it perhaps um, unwisely on one of our biggest productions we ever did in the, in the just outside of Rome, and I gave the GPS coordinates to a truck driver who put them in, they got two of the digits the wrong way around, he called, I'm here, you're not here, we're here, um, and he had mixed up two of the numbers, and he was uh, an hour north of Rome, not an hour south of Rome, um, <coughs> and then text messaging and calling in to time delays, uh, it, was a, it was a very, very bad day, and, um, and any time we tried using the coordinates, 
Um, we ran into difficulties. People didn't know what they were. They didn't know the pluses and the minus, the Ns and the Ss, and the whole thing got very, very complicated. So we you know, we thought about okay, could we make a solution? You know, the world would be amazing if we all said to each other, you know, do you want to meet for a beer later at 15.168.2972 degrees north, minus 0 0.03169482 degrees west um, for time. Um, but we figured this, this is never going to happen. Um, and we looked at what other people had done, and people had recognized the same problem, and they, they had broken the world up into effectively a big alphanumeric kind of military-like grid. But we figured that being able to say, okay, come to NZ, or VQN dot L29V wasn't really enough of a, an advantage over GPS coordinates. So we, we went for a really radical solution, which is that we realized that if you took a dictionary of the English language um, and a kind of, not even the full dictionary, but if you took 40,000 words, there were enough words that if you put three words together in a sequence, 40,000 times 40,000 times 40,000. There's actually 64 trillion combinations. And what that actually gives you is one sequence of three words for every three square meters on the planet, because about 57 <coughs> trillion three, three meter by three meter squares on the planet. And what well, we thought, of, well, hey, that's that's easier than using the latitude and longitude because it's three words and everybody can relate to that. And there's enough to go around so that we can actually go and label everyone. So that's what we did. This square in the uh, in the middle of London is gauged across like, and what this does is acts as a, a reference for this location. And if two people both know this system, I can say, for that beer, I'm going to meet you in gauged across like, and somebody else can say, okay, because you're both in the same system, and it's that simple, and it's three meters, no country codes, no messing around. So we we went ahead and did this, and we had a couple of key properties to doing this. Um, we said, okay, we've got a large number of words, some are short, some are long, some are common, some are not. So when we put our assignment words everywhere, we put the shorter words uh, in the cities and uh, on land, crucially, and put the longer words in the sea, as you can see. And then we did something which is very counterintuitive to anybody who has ever worked in geography, which is that we did it non-sequentially on purpose. Because when I thought about my Italian truck driver who'd made that mistake with his coordinates, well, that's what human beings do. And we needed to base this around <coughs> human interaction because human beings are lazy, they make mistakes. And if they're going to make a tiny mistake, what you don't want them doing is saying, oh, yeah, I'm going to New York. Oh, this is in New York, fine, and setting off, and then realizing they're wrong. We say if, if you're wrong, you need to know you're wrong. Um, so we, we assigned everything similar as far away as possible. So we put table chair lamps plural on the east coast of the US and we put table chair lamp as a three meter square in Australia. So that means you're always going to know, okay, hang on, I'm not going there. I've, I've made a mistake and uh, we can, we can inter actually intercept that. Looking forward. Um, so we thought about it in English, we discovered in English, but we realized that actually it's not too much work to replicate the system in a series of other languages, which we've also then done. So that if uh, if, if we wanted to meet uh, in Moscow, we haven't got to worry about difficult Russian spelling. Similarly, two Russian guys in Washington haven't got to worry about difficult English spellings. They can use three Russian words. So every single three meter square in the world has been given three words in a series of languages. We're up to eight languages and soon to be 12. So um, that's how the system works. And I think just this graph always gets me about um, I guess this is why latitude and longitude was never going to be used for that kind of beer because as soon as somebody says one, you've got to reach for a pen or a device and note it. Uh, you know, about 0% of people can actually remember all the 16 digits you need. That alphanumeric solution or any, any like that, people still can't really use that. You've got about 5% of people who can actually remember a 9 or 10 alphanumeric. But with something as simple as three words, well, everyone can get their head around that. Um, it's, it's pretty complex. Um, I'd like to just run a short video if that's okay.
We created what three words because addressing around the world just isn't good enough for everyday needs. There are a lot of complex geographical systems that you know, can talk about precise location, but it's totally unrealistic for people to walk around with long strings of latitudes and longitudes. We felt there was an opportunity to make something which was precise, yet incredibly simple for everybody to use. The amount of times that you're asking which entrance, which exit, which stadium gate, which car park, there's so many examples of where addressing just doesn't work. So what three words is like a big grid of the world. We've chopped the world up into three meter squares, so we've got 57 trillion three meter squares. And to each of those squares, we've assigned a sequence of three words from the dictionary. So it's as easy as saying table, lamp, spoon, and we've referred to some point in the world somewhere. A three-word address is much more memorable and much more accurate than, for example, a postcode or a street address. We have multiple languages available. We use 25,000 to 40,000 words for our word lists. It can be used with text input or voice input, and we have an inbuilt error detection mechanism. Our algorithm allows us to package it up into just 10 megabytes so it can fit on almost any device to be used offline without a data connection. So simply put, it's really easy to use. We're seeing it integrated in taxi companies, navigation apps, logistics firms, travel guides. There are so many ways that being simpler and more precise about location can help all these businesses. Unlike other geographical referencing systems, which are basically designed for technical use, the beauty of what three words is designed for ordinary people to use. It only takes a few seconds to understand how it works, and then anyone can communicate using the three words. Another big advantage of three words is that it covers the whole of the globe. And that's why I was really intrigued when I first saw what three words, because it was the first truly original system that I've come across in my career. So now everywhere has an address. It's the most beautiful places, the most fun places, the most critical, vital places. I mean, that's the beauty of it. Literally everywhere in the world now has a simple address. Okay, great. Um, if, we, uh, <laughs> if we get back to the slides, sorry, I just got a, a few more slides, but I think, um, I mean, just on a conceptual level, I hope to explain what we've done. But um, how, how does it uh, relate to this? business. And um, there was a quote which kind of grabbed me, I read in Post and Parcel, which says that even in the UK, which is pretty well addressed, um, research suggests that a 1% improvement in the government's address data would bring a 25 billion euro reduction in costs. Now, there are people here who would probably argue that figure depending on uh, country, but I think the point is that uh, addressing the time wasted uh, with poor address data um, is is a massive deal which can be fixed pretty simply by using a, a system which is based on latitude and longitude like ours um, because you're just eliminating any of that last mile confusion where things don't work and and importantly being able to deliver to a lot of places or countries or areas where you may just not be able to deliver if there's no address system a lot of people say well we can't work there because it would be totally inefficient um, because we'd have to be on the phone to customers talking about land posts whereas if there's something like this, and everybody's talking with three meters of accuracy, we see ourselves that we can enable people to work in Nigeria, Tanzania, and parts of um, Brazil and Latin America that they may not be operating. Um, so just a couple of um, uh, points about how we've been received so far. We've, we've been around two, two years. Um, we've been covered in Wired Magazine. We've had a huge amount of press um, around the world about how great the concept is. Um, notably, we won a competition ran by Wired Magazine for retail um, back in November to enable delivery to places which couldn't have delivery at the moment. Um, so I'm thinking of a lot of probably outside the US here where addresses are okay as a functioning system, but what about Costa Rica where there's not a single proper address in the country? Um, so we would love to be enabling, enabling uh, deliveries there. Um, and the, the quote on the right uh, is, is our mission in life, really. We want to become a new universal standard. If you see the three words, that is an address. It's an abstract mental shift away from the street address, but it, it acts as that three meter reference, and it's simple and it's universal. And we would like to be a universal standard. 
So how have we gone so far as a business? Well, what we've got, um, we spent a, a lot of time developing the product, but we've now got a whole series of apps which actually support the three words. Um, there's a selection here, which uh, the top right is actually the Norwegian National Mapping Agency who've taken to the system and now supports it in their website. There's NavMe there, which is the biggest offline mapping and navigation app in the world. Um, 25 million or so users, they now support and promote the use of the three words in their system. There's uh, 3D no, mapping app, GeoFly for the National Parks, a huge, huge range of services are adopting it because they all have problems with their users typing in addresses which don't exist. I mean, how do you reverse somewhere in the middle of a park? Um, if it's with coordinates, then that's hassle. Um, but we see logistics as the big business that we want to um, come in and work with. And now that we have this toolkit available, it's a toolkit which we can offer to you um, to actually make this happen. So um, I would like to finish just with a short video of, of the one logistics uh, use case that we've just been working on now. It's in Brazil. It's a company who deliver exclusively to the favelas in Rio de Janeiro, and they have been making their own mapping work, but it's been pretty uh, inefficient for them and taken an awful long time to put together. They've now discovered the Portuguese version of what three words and are now using it in the favelas. And I'd like to just run this short video to show you what we are doing there and how this could scale up. For those of you in here who'd like to employ something similar, can we just run this for a second video? Mais de 70% da rocinha tem computador. Mais de 70% tem efeito de LED de 30 ou 40 polegadas. Então, ela mostra que é uma comunidade que está crescente na sua renda e que investe. Porque o pessoal com a rocinha, acostumada e habituada a viver na Zona Sul, quer qualidade, quer uma coisa melhor e paga por isso. Foi um licenciador do meu centro de IBGE, no Brasil, no Brasil. E nós vimos que no modelo de lugares não tinha nome, não tinha endereço, não tinha número, e as pessoas não sabiam o seu endereço. Hoje a prefeitura ela não é obrigada a dar nome e número ao IB, porque não foi um valor público. E se você está no Google Maps, está ali 10, 15 ruas. Na verdade, nós temos mais de 3 mil ruas hoje em assim. Em comunidades, normalmente ele entrega as cartas na associação. Não entrega muito bem porque a mulher não tem nome, não tem número. O nosso trabalho começa aonde termina o decorrer convencional. Nós, no grupo da Vila Negra, nós criamos um sistema de mapeamento, que é patenteado por nós. Nós somos hoje a primeira franquia do país a sair de uma favela. E nós já operamos em 12 comunidades aqui no Rio. A nossa meta é expandir para todo o país o nosso serviço. Para a nossa empresa crescer, estamos constantemente procurando novas tecnologias. Nesta busca, encontramos uma empresa gritante, a voz do mundo. Acreditamos que eles possam ajudar a modernizar a nossa empresa. A voz do mundo tem uma tecnologia perfeita para nós, em que eles oferecem um sistema simples de ficar de endereço que se adapta ao nosso sistema. O World Rewards é uma grade gigante do mundo que identifica cada um dos 57 trilhões de quadrados de 3 por 3 metros por apenas três palavras. O Carteiro Amigo está começando a incorporar no aplicativo do World Rewards o seu trabalho na maior favela da América Latina, Ocinha. Utilizando três palavras em português, que significa que é fácil para os moradores lembrar e usar. As palavras já estão alocadas, então as pessoas não precisam esperar para receber o endereço. Já está lá, pronto para utilizar. Carteiro Amigo acredita que através do Watt Rewards, eles podem entrar em novas favelas, mais rápido e mais barato, e ampliar suas operações para atingir muito mais pessoas. Há mais de um milhão de moradores de favelas no mundo inteiro. Através da tecnologia de mapeamento do carteiro amigo, junto com o sistema de geração de endereços do Watt Rewards, todos eles, finalmente, poderão ter um endereço próprio. 
Great. Thank you very much. I'm sure many of you have questions, but if you hold it to the end, we want to make sure we can move along fairly quickly. Sean, we'll work with the parcels. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Uh, so, of all the people that have spoken today, uh, I represent probably the most outsider point of view. I felt that coming in, and after listening to all the talks, I feel even more so now. Um, I, I, I'm a little ashamed. I don't have any charts or graphs or percentages, so I hope that's going to be okay. Um, it's been interesting. There's been a lot of a lot of talk today about the importance of the customer, and that the customer is going to be driving a lot of how this group really needs to behave and change and really think about coming to them in a way that they understand that, and that they respect and, and that they really desire to, to interact with, right? So more and more, we're, we're beholden to them and their whims and desires, and we all know that they're fickle and they're lazy, and that's just what we're dealing with. Um, and so I've seen a lot of data pointing to trends and where customers are going, and not a ton of answers on what that future could look like and how we can attract them. And so what I come to you with is an answer without any data. So put the two things together, maybe we'll have an answer on how we can talk to customers. Um, as uh, Charles mentioned, uh, I work at a design firm, and I'm just going to prove to you really quickly um, how much of an outsider we are. So we designed the Heinz uh, ketchup bottle, uh, the plastic bottle that's on shelves today. So uh, they came to us and said, we need to, we need to restore some of our, our brand identity. We need to take cost out. So we redesigned a bottle that did both. So that bottle brings back a lot of the original glass heritage and also saved them approximately $15 and $20 million a year simply by unifying the cap in their manufacturing. Um, we designed the Reebok uh, retail store uh, in addition to all the Adidas global retail work uh, with their design partner record. So when Reebok partnered with CrossFit, uh, they had a tired and aging retail presence. We came in and, and we reinvigorated that for them. Uh, we worked with Best Buy to, to uh, design uh, house products. So when you think about the challenges of showrooming, uh, one of the strategies is house brands. If you have exclusive things that you can only get in your store, you can't be shown by Amazon because you won't let them sell that product. And so we came in and, and helped them develop a product line uh, that was directed exclusively at millennials. Uh, we've actually also helped with Insignia. See, there's Insignia TV here in front of me. Uh, so everything from product to uh, digital to brand, uh, we work with them. And uh, this is where I, I told you as an outsider, it's a little bit of a lie because we also work with our friends at, at, uh, at FedEx. Um, we haven't worked with them on and off for the past 15 years. Uh, one of the pro projects that we worked on was uh, actually helping them establish their first retail presence. Uh, as soon as we finished this project, everyone was very, very excited about it. We were going to go roll this out nationally. Uh, and then another business unit acquired Kinko's and the way that strategy went. It's the way things go occasionally. But a lot of the insights that led to the development of this concept ultimately have been rolled into the new FedEx office uh, presence that you're starting to see today. So, but why am I here? Um, it turns out this is actually the Wired magazine panel. I had no idea you'd been covered in Wired, so I hope that you two have been covered in Wired so we can maintain that trait. So uh, we have a relationship with Wired magazine, a lot of design firms do. And I was sitting down with the, uh, the editor of the design function, and I, and I said, Cliff, a lot of the times when you issue design provocations, uh, Adam, thank you for saying the word provocation first. I'm going to steal it and pick it up and run with it. Uh, it's a lot of sort of fanciful futures. It's the future of wearable technology. It's how will drones uh, save us or kill us? Uh, and so you get a lot of um, concept renders on wearable tech that are impossible to implement. You get images of drone selfies. This is the kind of stuff that Wire will put out there when they're thinking about uh, the future. And I said, we've got all these great folks in your network that could be thinking about how to design better experiences for humans. Why don't you let us take a crack at that? And, and we, we called the project uh, the future mundane. Uh, I encourage you not to be insulted by the term mundane. Um, what everyone in this room does is monumental. The amount of data, four million miles are driven each year, and the number of packages and parcels is incredible. Uh, and you do such a good job that, that most people uh, are bored by it or take it for granted or don't understand the complexity of the systems that you're working in. And so they take it for granted and they think about drones and selfies and that sort of thing. Again, these are the customers that they're designing for. And so we pitched three ideas to them. Uh, the first was, could we could we reframe um, shopping in urban bodegas to be much faster? We looked at the trend of reurbanization, trying to get more throughput through there. How could you turn that to be much more digital so a shopper could walk in, grab their things, and leave, and we could eliminate the lines? 
Uh, they didn't like that idea. If they did, that'd be a different conference. Um, the other one that we that we looked at was gardens. So again, as, as more and more people move into cities, uh, they move into smaller pieces of land, the idea of being able to grow and eat your own food becomes less and less likely. So what if instead you could network together all of the small parcels of land to create sort of, not necessarily a, a, a communal place, but, but a shared social network around gardening. You could understand what the yield is you're building. Again, I would be a garden conference if that was what we had selected. Um, but then, then we also took a look at what could we do if we looked at shipping. We applied all of the modern digital tools, the Internet of Things we talked about a lot, and we came up with a concept of personal shipping. And they said, let's do that. So that's where we are with Signet. Now, what's interesting is um, this concept, it doesn't talk at all about pretty much anything we've been talking about today. It doesn't talk about the last mile. It doesn't talk about the first mile. It doesn't even acknowledge who's going to pick up the package. All it talks about is, as a sender, how can I make that more easy? How can I make that more, how can that, the, the act of sending something be more of an emotional experience than a functional one? How can it be something that connects me to the person or the entity that I'm sending it to, as opposed to just being a, a series of steps I have to go through to, to send a package? So um, I'm going to show you the video of the concept, and then I'll break down its constituent parts. <laughs> So um, when we started a concept like this, we talked a lot about the value chain today. The value chain is, is critical. When we, when we do consumer-led innovation, we have a similar tool that we call the customer journey. And when you, when you map out a customer journey, you look at all of the moments of interaction that a person has with the experience, with your product, with your service. And, and we just map them very simply against, uh, is this a moment of love or is it a moment of pain? Is it a moment of deep and crushing sadness for that person? <laughs> and so when we looked at the current shipping experience, you know, a lot of the love points come in the emotion of sending. And this is really a parcel base, which is if I'm going to send something to another person, I feel really good when I want to do that. But then I feel really bad when I have to figure out who am I going to send this with? Who has the best price? Do I have the right address? Are they going to get it on time? When do they need it? I've got to go through all these functional steps just to get the package out the door. And then I get the emotional high when I receive either a thank you note or a confirmation that that's been received. And, and what's interesting is 
you think about the emotional side of that, it's me sending to my friend. But as soon as I hand the package to the carrier, uh, that relationship between the, the package and the person receiving it is also handed off. And now it's, 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 it's a mediated relationship as opposed to being a facilitated relationship. So when you think about that video, uh, the carrier and the application the Signet promises, it becomes a platform for communication. So when I'm sending you something, we both get alerts, the sender and the receiver that says, hey, this thing is in route. We can start a communication around that package. So it becomes an extension of the way people are used to communicating today. We're not trying to slap social media into, you know, your, your, your box sends you a tweet when it hits the hub station. It's not about the box. It's not about the USPS or UPS or FedEx. It's about, you know, Sean's chat. And so we really want to facilitate that as much as possible. The other thing that happens when you make that participatory is the receiver can now take some control of that more so than they can today. In some products, they have control to redirect, uh, but even the ability to expedite. So it's on the way. I'm cheap. I sent it seven day by horse, and someone says, nope, I need it tomorrow, and they, they do it the next day, and that person pays the $5. So really trying to think about uh, a shared experience there, but then also, of course, rerouting, redirecting, all that sort of good stuff. Um, when you start to think about building an experience from scratch, you think about, you know, we talked a lot about digital and physical. How do you marry digital and physical together? And how does that all work? And we talked about Internet of Things. And when you start to digitize a lot of this process, what then is the role of the physical object? And, and what does it do? And so one of the design principles for Internet of Things is you have this, this movement kind of away from the smartphone, which is, uh, which is a general purpose device. The, 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 your smartphone is effectively a digital Swiss Army knife. Uh, Swiss Army Knife is a great tool if you want to do a bunch of things in a mediocre way. Not a great tool if you've got a very specific need. And so when we looked at this and said, okay, if a lot of this goes digital, we can create what we call a strong specific experience. And so when you start to think about that, we started to design this digital stamping tool, um, which we, which uh, really takes its design influence from uh, you know, the old wax seals that you would have to sort of make your mark. And, and really we're able to say, if this is the only thing that you use, you have the opportunity to make it beautiful. So we looked at, you know, very uh, uh, sort of warm materials, wood, all that sort of good stuff. And then, of course, if you put a laser in something, you attract a lot of attention. Uh, but the idea is, it's a very simple, seamless. You put it on your parcel. You get, you hit the button. It makes the mark, which is unique, dynamically generated in the moment, and then you hand it to your, to your postal carrier. And the digital experience allows you to then add information along the way. So the idea that I could stamp a package and give it to someone without even knowing where it goes, because I don't have the address on hand, I'm going to get it later, allows me then, because the promise of digital is I can do things in the interstitial moments of my life, when I'm waiting in line, uh, when I'm stuck in traffic. So it doesn't prohibit me from getting the package in motion. This is the thing that we were trying to overcome is, how do you just get people to, to send the things that are stuck on your desk? Um, coming back to the digital app, again, you know, a lot of this just takes best practices from other industries, Uber, those types of things. Um, really allowing participation uh, on both sides, and that facilitates the shipping process. Um, and then finally, this mark. Um, so this is, I, I, I'm fully aware there are a lot of things that, that, that we don't understand on how the scanning and processing works, and there are lots of things that are wrong with this idea, which is why it's a provocation, uh, something to think about. Um, but we really, we took the mark and we compressed three pieces of information to a single mark. Uh, where is the package going? What's the return address? And, uh, and, and, and the postage, the cost of it. So the idea that you can move from three marks to one, and also thinking that those marks are all designed for the function. Everything that goes onto a box is designed for the beautiful machines that are designed by the companies in this room. They're not designed for the human that stamps them. Um, and, and we think you can accomplish both. We think you don't have to sacrifice something that looks beautiful that can also be functional. And so you know, we put a, a mark together that uses the same dynamic security pattern that currency uses uh, to protect it. Uh, it has a dot pattern that can be replicated the same, uh, somewhere in between a barcode and a QR code for amount of data you can put in it. Registration points so that the optical scanners can lock and read it consistently every time. Um, and also the ability in the center to add your personal brand or your personal mark. So you can imagine Etsy shippers and these sort of high volume people who don't want to pay fulfillment services really latching onto something like this, the opportunity to brand and do things very, very quickly. Um, so all said and done, that's it for presenting the Signet concept. Um, built from the ground up as an ecosystem, uh, an ecosystem that ignores uh, the center point, which you have all talked about with in so much detail. And you can start to think about um, 
this concept could also create a marketplace for shipping, right? It doesn't say who's even going to pick it up. We talked earlier, or, or John in the provocation about, you know, as, as a receiver, I don't get to decide if it's UPS or FedEx or USPS. But this one, I don't care. I, it needs to go for me to jump. And who's ever going to get it there on time for the best price could turn into a marketplace. There. So um, that's all I have. Uh, thank you, John, for inviting me and allowing me to present an outsider's view on how we might do this. So thank you very much. Okay. Um, as an academic, I play with numbers and equations. So I'm clearly going to have to run my slides uh, with these guys for music and visuals in order to get them right. Uh, in order to see how things are going on this. So um, I, I want to bring you two different ideas. And I want to bring, I want to touch on two things that, um, that Jim Cochran said. One of them was the post office being actively engaged in building platforms. And another is how are we going to connect physical and digital. How is that actually going to work? I'm going to do that first by showing you some of the transformations that are taking place in the economic world, in industry. And then I want to actually take you through an enhancement to a possible shipping model and see if we can build an economic model of business behind some of these activities. So let's take a look. This is a list of the most famous brands in the world. I want to draw your attention to um, this is something like Interbrand. Three of the most famous companies, are the, the biggest ones, are Amazon, Apple, and Google. They've got the bigger block because they've grown fastest. One thing I want to draw your attention to is that ever since they've been keeping records, Coca-Cola had been not number one, but they got knocked off by Apple and Google, both of whom spend less in advertising per capita than Coca-Cola. It's interesting that advertising alone is no longer why folks recognize a brand. Um, Interbrand recognizes that Google has become such a day-to-day -day part of your life. Even children know what it's about. So they say Google it. So it's become really interactive. And then interactivity is what's leading to the, uh, the, the recognition of it. I'd also point out that 13 of the top 30 are what I would call platform companies. This is just in terms of fame. Liz, I mean, they have ecosystems built around them. So Apple and Google have developers. IBM, Microsoft, they all have developers. eBay has uh, purchase and um, sellers on it. Uh, and Express uh, is another one. Another interesting example is consumer products. We take a look at Nike. They built Nike Fuel. They built a community around their product. They also helped to build a platform around their product. And I don't mean platform shoe. I mean they've actually got an ecosystem around this too uh, to get their system together. Uh, they've been impressive that way. If you look at the presence on the internet, it's completely dominated by platform companies. This is Google, Facebook, Yahoo, others. In order to read this, I've blown it up. But if you go over to China, you see the same thing. If you focus on <coughs> Russia, it's the same thing. If you focus on the Middle East, it's the same thing. So in terms of internet presence, it's there. Most importantly, take a look at the numbers. If you look at the largest firms by market cap, it's now Apple, uh, Microsoft, and Google are three of the top five, uh, the others being ExxonMobil and Berkshire Hathaway. These platform companies are knocking off banking and energy companies that had been the reigning champions of the market capitalization world, the most valuable companies in the world. And this is a trend that's gone on for almost 20 years. If you index the, the proportion of firms in the top 20 by market cap or platform firm, it's been on a relatively upward trend for a really long time. So that's just the data on platforms, why I think platform is an interesting thing to model and study and why I think the post office should be embracing uh, platform business models. How are we going to get there? Um, one of the things I want to draw attention to if you look at the companies who are succeeding, Google, Twitter, and Facebook have interactivity. I'm willing to bet that all of you have interacted with at least one of these companies before. Right? Fair guess? Each of these companies also has at least a metric of user engagement. Let's take the click-through, for example. Um, Google gauges the effectiveness of its ads on the click-through rate. That's even how they charge for it, as opposed to just showing up and whether or not folks have seen it or not. Uh, similarly with Facebook and Twitter, there's a way to go gauge how much users have interacted with the content. Uh, and in fact, the numbers on the right-hand side show Google now earns more globally than all newspapers and magazines in the United States combined. That's a hell of an economic accomplishment. Um, so they've really managed to use this new kind of advertising model to succeed in a way that I think the uh, traditional um, volatile advertising is actually suffering. What I'd like to see is we can get something, some way for users to express their preference. So we've been talking a lot at the conference about how to capture user preference. How would we do that? 
We also want to get interactivity, give folks a voice and give them a way to engage with the content, give them a way to get data and feedback to drive improvement. One of the interesting slides that we put up earlier was all the analytics being done, but I want to argue politely that no amount of data analytics on process improvement alone is actually going to solve the revenue problem for the post office. I'd really like to see if we create a new data layer that will build revenue and not just cost containment. See what we can do about that. Um, do we have a mechanism for routing the information flows along with the monetary flows along with the physical capacity? Can we put all of those things across the platform? And can we do it with ecosystem partners? Can we do it with uh, the R anomalies, the Bell and Howells, with the, um, uh, the, the other members of the postal ecosystem? How are we going to do that? So the next couple of slides are something that I may have shown you um, before, but there are a couple of enhancements I want to bring your attention to. So let's consider a mechanism which captures information. Now, I have used the QR code. I think Signet has something that's far more elegant and beautiful. I like to capture the kind of information that's in there. The beautiful thing about this is you can embed massive amounts of information uh, in a QR code. So if we take something like that and then we uh, blow it up, or you use something that's uh, even more elegant, uh, is that so? We'd have to give a, a nod to a better way to do this, uh, engage for new one. Um, you might be able to embed additional information in that. So, in this case, suppose I'm trying to market an SUV or a car. In this case, the QR code um, would allow you to then capture information in it, which includes the if you scan it, to actually get the information. So, the stamp shows up, or it shows up in the advertisement um, in the circular, or it shows up in the uh, home delivery on the scan. You then learn the sender, the recipient, the content. That's a critical element. It's embedded in the information. You learn the date, and oh, wait a second. There's something else over here. There's money in this. The recipient gets this. There's a tiny amount of currency that's actually embedded that the user gets to claim as part of it just by engaging with the ecosystem. If you engage with the ecosystem, then it could be any amount, by the way. A penny, you're going to get to choose it as the sender. Are you going to try to get their attention for a penny? Are you going to try to get their attention for two dollars? It's up to you to decide that. But if they engage with the system, all they have to do is provide a tiny bit of information back to the ecosystem. The way this works is, geez, you send, well, I love it. You can click that box. Or, yeah, I don't want this much. Stop sending this stuff, please. Or, you know what? Tell me more about this. Suppose it's a credit card solicitation. I'll ask you, how much is the cost of customer acquisition for a new credit card? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Oh, how much is it? How much? Thousand dollars? It's, it's extremely expensive. I don't think it's quite that expensive, but it's extremely. So make it two, maybe two digits instead of three digits. It's very expensive uh, to do that. Watch what happens with a system like this, where you can engage with the system. So. The credit card solution shows up, in this case, we've got a four cent solicitation in here. In exchange for four cent, the bank might learn, do you like the offer or do you not like the offer? If you don't like the offer, well, why not? Is it the interest rate? Is it you don't like Citibank? Is it maybe you don't like the pre complier point or the personalization? You can find that information out simply by asking for it. Or guess what? If they do like it, they're already authenticated. Because the sender information is there, and you can do it immediately. You can actually conduct that transaction. So for four extra cents, maybe you could go ahead and issue a credit card, which would be a staggering reduction in the cost of customer acquisition. Suppose we ignore it. You can raise the offer from four cents to six cents on the next go round and see if that gets their attention. Really interesting because you could raise that to a 50 cents or whatever, because finally we can get their attention. And guess what? If that level they still don't do it, what happens? It expires. It's the extra cost is zero. If they never engage with the system, the four cents or the six cents or the fifty cents simply expires and you can use it again or another solicitation for someone else. So either you've issued the for the credit card for six cents, or you've learned why they don't want it, or there's no extra cost whatsoever. It's a business model that actually captures digital information in the ecosystem. Take another example. Suppose I start a new restaurant in the area. We'll make it a Thai restaurant. The Thai restaurant can actually say, here's the eight cents for giving us information whether or not you like it. But I'll give, tell you what. I'll give you another eight cents if 
you forward this to your friends or neighbors who you happen to know like I do, you can cause the ad to go viral. You're rewarding behavior and you're capturing information from your user base in a way that will actually create a more stable ecosystem and bring more people into the platform. Using a mechanism of this sort, you can then trace the social network. So a physical piece of paper is shown up in a magazine or a postal uh, bulk mailing. And you then use that to then add additional information to bring other people in with a single ad. The other thing that's interesting is once you've scanned it, that ad is right there on your phone. My mother in law loves to cut coupons, for example, but she always hates losing them and showing up at Target or Stop and Shop and not having a coupon delivered. Well, guess what? All of that stuff's archived on your mobile device. You show up, scan it, unload it, you're done. All of that stuff is available, and it can also handle the coupon here in addition to whatever the offer was itself. So in this restaurant example, maybe they're giving you a free appetizer that you show up. At the time you pay the bill, it automatically takes the appetizer off. The eight cents is for visualizing it or spreading it or giving the information. The embedded coupon offer can be about the product itself you would get, so you can get additional information all captured with this kind of a mechanism. Take another example. Um, we have a book that's coming out on how to execute on the platform strategy. Norton's going to be producing it this fall. Suppose that Norton then tries to advertise to subscribers of the New York Times. You could say, here's 10 cents to take a look at the ad, and we'll give you a $10 coupon off on the book. If you're a subscriber, we know that information, and it's going to be arriving in your New York Times subscription. Or, wait a second, someone third party scans it, you weren't the intended subscriber. Well, we can give you a 25 cent offer to capture your information, but then maybe a $5 coupon offer. This would give us a mechanism to find out where else this information has circulated. How many times might someone see a magazine or a newsprint that shows up in an office, or you see a newspaper on the subway, or you shared a magazine article with a friend? You'd actually be able to capture this penumbra, this extra shadow of other people seeing the ad in a way you've never been able to capture this information before because it's now targeted and able to distinguish between the recipient and the non-recipient and make different offers to these different parties. It's a remarkable amount of additional information simply by motivating behavior. Notice, by the way, this works for any kind of print. Again, the whole hope is to merge print advertising with the digital space. So it can work on bulk mail, it can work on magazine, you can work on inserts, circulars, anything you could print as an advertisement to try to capture attention. It would be a mechanism to try to pull more folks back into your ecosystem. So here's the opportunity. Take a look at this. The total advertising market is about $223 billion. I want to draw again attention to this. This is the orange or the red over here. This is the direct mail area. This is the, um, I don't think you can see the numbers in here, but this is the, the green is the one internet space. Over here is TV, is a magazine and, and uh, newsprint. This big blue is television. How many of these triangles are interactive? At present, there's only one, the internet one. This is a mechanism to suddenly make print advertising interactive. This means you might be able to take print advertising and go after the entirety of this other space. The problem with facing postal service is it's only a cost basis. It's not a new revenue model. Maybe we can use a system like this to go after a new revenue stream that's actually quite large. You're not just trying to recover the bulk mail. You want to actually be able to go after TV, radio, and even some of the internet business. Because you're able to capture all of this additional information and bring it as part of the ecosystem. But that's just the ad world. In addition, once you've got the platform, you can conduct transactions through the platform, you start to go after the e-commerce world. E-commerce ecosystem is 36% bigger than the entire ad world. You've got a platform that now you can actually match buyers and sellers through your ecosystem using the data layer, who wants what. Conduct the transaction through the platform in a way that folks can reach. An advertiser can reach through the platform to a customer and actually do the business. The business can then deliver off the platform the product or the service on top of the platform. So you're going after an even bigger market than the advertising market. And oh, by the way, that's just the US. If you look at the global market, it's $1.5 trillion present. That's an ecosystem play. It would actually create some revenues. It might actually be quite profitable. 
the estimate is that we've up to 2.3 trillion dollars, an order of magnitude larger than the current advertising marketplace. Again, I think there's some economics here that actually look relatively attractive in terms of what might be possible with new revenue streams. So, um, with that in mind, um, you know, I guess I would have now violated every design constraint. Yeah, yeah, I know there's too much text on the, on the design here. So I really just want to draw your attention to one or two uh, items on here. In terms of the consumer, the consumer is gaining a voice. They get a buy it now option to go directly through the platform, and they're getting paid for their opinion. They can volunteer what they want. They can say what they don't want. You can actually tell the ecosystem what they do and what they don't. The advertiser gains all kinds of things. You've got vastly high response rates. You've got notification of instant delivery because they automatically collect on it. Um, physical becomes a portal to digital. The two are merged at the point of that coupon um, and then and the beautiful signet or QR code would be that point. You can learn, you can make it go viral and there's almost no incremental cost. You don't pay the extra six cents for each other if they don't interact with the system. So that simply expired. So it's almost costless if you're not getting the transaction or you're not getting the information that you want. And mostly, you're motivating behavior. You're motivating engagement with the system because they're going to get the, uh, the four cents, the twenty-five cents, whatever you're offering them, in order to engage and provide that information. It's voluntary. We don't have a problem with privacy if they're giving you that information because they volunteer. They're being paid for that information. And most, of course, the platform provider. Now, this could be. USPS, or it could be Fit and Bose, or it could be Mellon Howell, or it could be Amazon, depending on who puts the platform together. You're creating a closed data feedback loop that allows you to grow the ecosystem. It gives you the data from which to do the analytics in here. Um, you could do location based move updates because you've got the mobile phone and the physical match immediately. So that could be a simple mechanism that would help the post office. But above and beyond all of this, you're getting new sources of revenues. Among these, you're getting New transactions fees, how many deals that go through the system. New source of revenues from the escrowed funds that are unclaimed. New sources of revenue from third party app development built on top of the new data layer, just like the iTunes store and Android ecosystem store. And you're getting a new source of revenue from selling a new kind of stamp. Again, the hope is to put this into a new business model, a new financial ecosystem, not just to cut costs, but to do it in a way that each of the ecosystem partners wins. You give customers a voice, you give advertisers vastly more effective advertising uh, mechanisms, and you create a revenue stream for the underlying platform that runs the whole system. Um, if you can't read the bullet points, please just email me on that. That's the one thing you need. Or uh, pieces of this are described in an OIG report uh, put out by um, uh, Dave Williams' group. So it's, uh, I'm happy to provide any of that information uh, for any of you that are interested. So with that, I'm happy to turn it over to others and ask for advice on doing more beautiful. <laughs> so I'm Jody from Breaker Advisors. We're a very small company with limited amount of resources. So we try to focus on things that matter, that are very practical, that can make a difference. We focus on things that are practical, that can make a difference for our clients. Thank you for pointing out that you couldn't hear me. <laughs> so, on the left, you'll see a picture of a New York City school, but it's real school, the School of Collaboration and the School of the Future. And I just want to remind us what we've learned so far in Postal Vision 2020 in the five, four years, depending upon where you've been engaged. Back in 2011, um, Larry Weber pointed out uh, that the Postal Service has a operational advantage in the change of address system and suggested that we look at a possible way to make that social. And so that's still an opportunity on the table for those of us that are interested in exploring these possibilities that have been discussed in the past at Postal Vision 2020. Um, in 2012, uh, we had Matt Swain suggest the possibility that the Postal Service could open up all of its IP systems and to the private spe sector to spur innovation. And you see a lot of innovation here without the IP systems even being open. Um, in 2013, we saw a whole lot of far out ideas become reality. SoPost told us about how we can use our social ID to get mail delivered wherever we want, whenever we want. Letters enabled us to use an app to generate a physical mail piece. And both Gov Delivery and Escher were doing amazing things to integrate democracy, social, internet, and physical communications. 
So here we are in 2015 exploring a whole lot of new ways, and I hope you have fun doing it. Um, we now live in a world where when is the new where? We're dealing with conditional addressing. You can actually have a pizza delivered to the park so you and your friends can have a picnic. Timing is everything. Uh, a couple of months after the postal in, uh, PAEA in 2006, the iPhone was introduced and communication changed forever. Um, just two weeks ago, there was a new app introduced called Magic, if you read about it in TechCrunch, a simple text message free form, ask for anything you want, and they will deliver it so long as it's legal. <laughs> they got 15,000 requests in 48 hours, they had to shut down. I mean, they are meeting those requests, but it was a rather demanding service. So who is this person now? That's part of the challenge that corporations, companies are trying to deal with as we all become who we are in different facets of our lives. The census demonstrates that we have more unique people than we have unique names, whether it's first names or last names. And for lots of reasons, people change their names over the course of their lives or use different forms of their identity in different venues. And companies are struggling to figure out who you are. And companies with legacy systems have an even more difficult time figuring that out because their databases can't grow fast enough for the explosion of data available to identify these individuals. So keeping track of this stuff is really not easy. <laughs> and we all learn that preferences make a difference. And we all kind of know that establishing preferences is a really easy thing. We do it on our phone and we do it on our apps, but we do it on each app individually. Now, how many apps do you have on your phone? <laughs> your customer expects you to listen and learn about what they like. They're investing their time to put their preferences in those apps so that you respond appropriately to those preferences that they've articulated. Do you remember when you were little and your mom used to pour you a glass of milk and she would say, say when? The point is, even your mother had to ask. <laughs> more data elements provide more details, more accurate information about figuring out who this individual is, what they want, and when they want it. Now, most large mailers were not born yesterday. So they have legacy systems that can't easily adapt to the exploding amount of data as we've acknowledged. Um, Sasha here has 78 apps, but she mostly used 20 of them. I don't know who's going to invent what next, and hopefully if you did, you'd tell us here. But with my magic wand, I'd create a new app called Say When. And I could figure out when I want it, what I want it, and tell you about it, and you could deliver it. So as far as I know, even though you think there may be obstacles, there's no real technological obstacles to creating any of the things that Marshall, Chris, or Sean have talked about today, or any of the speakers earlier. And what I'd like is for some of you to raise your hand and say you're interested in experimenting with us. Let's go on the journey of making it happen. Anyone raising their hand? <laughs> I see you in the back. <laughs> Great. Come with us. There you have it. Uh, as I told you, it would be different. And we have time for questions. Uh, any questions? Who? Yes. Do we have a microphone? I'll speak loudly. Do it loudly, yes. Chris, question about my three words. How are you handling the third dimension of delivery? Obviously, the, the map is two dimensions, right? Latitude and longitude. Yeah. I'm in a 40-story building. How do I differentiate my address from the address of my neighbor that's 10 stories above? Sure. Um, it would be pretty straightforward for us to add a height parameter if we wanted to. It would be your table, dot lamp, dot spoon. Or, or such like. But I think um, it would be really easy to do, but at the moment it wouldn't be a huge amount of point until indoor mapping, indoor GPS positioning, indoor navigation would be kind of commonplace in more than just a few token convention centers and hotels. Um, then it might actually be useful to specify, you know, it's this door 
But I think at the moment um, there's enough problems in the 2D world of addressing and the uh, guesswork and inaccuracies involved in all of that that we're just focusing entirely on that problem. But we're future proofing that we could just add a micro parameter when we want to. Anyone else? I have a follow up question to that. Um, do you have an app? that would give me a series of what three words to follow to get from place A to place B in, for example, New York City. Uh, yes, um, I mean, we've, we've got that. Today you can uh, you can check the three words of where you are right now. You can check the three words of the front door to your house that we've already given you. Um, I'm not sure you would really want to route by uh, Three words, then you have a load of waypoints in your uh, in your route. Uh, certainly, when you specified your waypoint in our app, you can navigate there using Google or Apple or Waze or whatever. We don't want to get involved with navigation. There's plenty of people doing really great work in navigation. Um, but what happens all the time when they're using those great navigation apps is that they end, end up in the wrong place, and that's what we're thinking. So I think it's less about the routing uh, and more about where it's in. Any other questions? Yes, in the back, please. Uh, also, I don't know if Lordy suitably. Take the mic because we're on the, on the air. Hi, Mike. Um, I'm not sure if this is a germane question, but uh, we say government authorities use addressing and assignment of addressing in those advertising and tax uh, services and other services. By offering something that might be more user friendly, easier to get, is there a rub point with government? Are they going to like or dislike that? Because they live right now they're in a control position. Before I get my mail, I've got to go register and get that address. Um, sure, I think the governments that we're talking to at the moment are the ones where they're really struggling with addressing, and they're very open to the fact that there's a solution available now and that we've actually addressed their country because. What they're looking at is the prospect of spending tens of millions of dollars um, and many, many years to get something that resembles a proper street addressing system up and running. So if you get to the situation where people can now vote, take out a loan and do a series of things with a three-word address, well, they're really receptive to that. So and I was going to add that in countries where there is an addressing system, companies can take the data from what three words and translate the existing addressing system. So in some ways it actually might help them as far as taxation and identification, which could be a plus for them. Sure. I think, I mean, a three-word address simply converts to a latitude and longitude, and anybody's system will work very, very well on latitude and longitude. We're just giving that simple human interface to let them get that data that they want. Um, so their back-end systems will, will love it. In fact, what they do is, you know, they'll take that street address and try and turn it into a latitude and longitude. So yeah, all, all we're doing is helping with a simple human interface and a really, really fine resolution of three meters. In the back, please. Sure, Matt Swain with InfoTrends. Marshall, question for you. Um, fascinating approach to changing the way we think about the stamp uh, and, and the use of the quick response code. Uh, what's the next step there? Uh, certainly, certainly, you've thought it out uh, quite a bit, but, but where are you going from this and, and this time next year? Where, where do you hope to be? Well, the one thing, really, the issue would be who would be adopting it and who would be willing to try a particular area. Um, I had some conversations with some foreign posts, uh, some in Europe, some in China. Uh, ironically, it may be a commercial firm in the United States to try something like this, of course. I think one of the best ways to make it happen would be try to get a geographic saturation in a particular area, say San Francisco or New York, and then have businesses start to use it, show that it works. Uh, and then blow it out from there. So um, this is an example of those marketplaces where you're trying to set a standard and then get folks to use an adopt a standard. It's actually quite similar to uh, three words in a sense. Anytime you're trying to set a standard, you always got this adoption and uh, use question. And then you just have to get critical mass. So if you get a, either a company or a state enterprise that can help get critical mass, then that can actually um, help to take off. Um, I suspect there'd even be enough folks consortium in this world that would really want to try uh, push it hard, but we can try to do it. So, if I, if I may add to that, I think actually a place you may want to start is Google. And one of the reasons I say that is because QR codes as a consumer interaction are a failure. They're done, they don't work. And they don't work because everyone has to release their own app. 
No one's going to download a USPS QR coding app. They're, they don't know what the value is. They don't know why to do it. It's not going to work until QR reading is embedded in the camera at the OS level so that you just take a photo of it and something happens. So if you sell this to Google as a way to extend AdWords in the physical space and they embed it in the OS, you've suddenly got hundreds of millions of installed users who can interact with the system. So um, when you think about, again, stuff about that customer journey, it's the downloading of the app is a huge barrier. It's why QR codes work so well in infrastructure and they don't work for consumers because you have to project value. And I'm not going to download an app for four cents. I just I probably, and then it was an app for, is this the right one? So I think that's where you start. And then you have the install base to, to, to make that. Yeah. I actually completely agree with Sean. I think it's absolutely right. <laughs> like, and I think you know, other candidates are Apple for Apple Pay, Google for Google Pay, Alibaba for Alipay, uh, any of those ecosystems for Xiaomi, uh, you know, the ones. Once you get it bundled into operating systems that explode, uh, I think it'll be just a matter of time. Time for one last question. Let's see one. Can I say that by uh, acclamation, we can introduce Sean and Chris into the community of the postal world? And thank all our speakers. Um, well, we uh, I know we went through the cookies pretty quick, and uh, so we had a lot of sugar, and we're tired. Uh, but uh, and we're nearly ready to wrap. Uh, but we have one more powerful exercise, and uh, that experiment we did earlier of our of our workshop uh, surprised me and a lot of us by how well it went. It was tough to break you up. We were very uh, engaged. So we're going to do this one more time, and uh, we, we're going to do it quickly, because uh, we, it is the end of the day. Um, so I'm going to give it back to Michael, and for your, for your last assignment of the day. Thank you. All right, let me get set up here, and we will get started shortly. I want to tell you that uh, it appears that we have resolved the technical glitch for this morning. And I've had a chance to look at some of the data that you shared, some of your insights, and uh, uh, great stuff. Thank you. You'll be seeing it tomorrow morning uh, when we kick off the session. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, if you, you should be already set up to use this, but just a quick reminder, if you want to use text messages or the, uh, the web access, so I will get out of that. <laughs> All right, and I want to make sure we are good to go here. Excellent. We should be live now on both platforms. So, I've been really interested in I've been really interested in these next two questions because uh, for a couple reasons, these are the questions that really look forward. This and the next question are really going to help us understand where you see things going. Uh, the first question, as you can already see, is um, can Post contribute to profitably provide both mail and shipping? We've heard a lot of that from uh, so far. It looks like a whole bunch of you right now believe the answer is yes. By the way, are you all able to get in from both platforms? Yes? That's good. Not text. All right. Still not text. You're serious. Text. Is text ready? Yes. I'm here both. Good. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Very good. So let's move on to the next one. This next question, now I will tell you, I have been intrigued with this question ever since we decided to use it. We're asking you to look into the year 2020. With everything you've seen, everything you've heard, the insights that you've got, we want to get a sense from you around what's the ratio of mail to shipping revenue going to be in 2020. You'll see in the U.S. So think about the U.S., the trends over the next five years or so. 
the big unveil as this opens up. So, is it going to be 80 20 mail shipping, 60 40, 40 60, or 28 mail shipping? By the way, the red team, uh, the red teams in your discussion are going to be addressing, unpacking this very insight. So please do give them, a, give them all you've got here to figure out where you think the revenue trends are going to be in the next five years. And I want to let this one run a little more because I actually, like I said, I think this is one of the most intriguing questions we've asked you today, at least on this one. A lot of intriguing questions, <laughs> but in this one, I, I think this is actually one more intriguing. And give you a few more seconds. If we see, uh, it looks like we pretty much started to decline in the responses. Oh, we got a few more Late, later hours here. Excellent. Any more? Uh, 20 more seconds or so? Let us know what you think. Right now it looks like 40 mail shipping, or 60 shipping is uh, is the one that really represents the, uh, the consensus in the room as the numbers continue to change. Get them all out. <laughs> There you go. Let's close that poll out. So again, red team, uh, just a second, I'm going to flip over to the questions of the afternoon, but I, I need you to uh, to jot those down if you would, because we're going to have a discussion based on that. So what do you see here? Ten, uh, ten of you believe it's going to be 80-20 split, 17 believe it's 60-40 split. The, the, uh, the mobile answer here is 25 believe it's going to be 40% mail, 60% shipping. And 11 of you think it's going to be 20% mail and 80% uh, Very good. Thank you. Yes, sir. What, um, and, and what it is today is, is A. All right. So clearly some shifts, shifts of foot. All right. With that, let me, let me get us back over to the full room discussion. So we've had uh, a few folks that have that have left the room. So what I'm going to ask is this. I want to walk through these questions with you first and tee them up. And then I'm going to ask each of the facilitators that's left, because I know we've had a few that have, uh, that have had to leave. Just hold your numbers up. Those of you who are uh, at a table without a facilitator or a table with one or two folks, I would please ask you to come to one of the tables that is going to be discussing the question that's most interesting to you, right? And, and we'll consolidate a little bit because we have had a few folks leave. But let's walk through. Tables one through five, the red uh, tables. Again, as I said, what we want to ask you is, given the responses from this room for the last two questions, how are the posts going to remain viable? Right? What do they need to do to address, if we assume this room represents conventional wisdom? Common wisdom. Wisdom. Okay. <coughs> wisdom. How should the post react to that? The green tables, six through ten. We spent a lot of time this afternoon, <coughs> intriguing discussions, I thought, about the future of, uh, of uh, posts in a e-commerce logistics world. So the green tables, we want to ask you, what could or should the role of post be in a logistics world shaped by Amazon and Alibaba. Tables 11 through 15, the blue tables near the, uh, the back third of the room. I'm going to ask you to explore the topic. What innovations would allow the post to ride the wave of e-commerce delivery growth? And the fourth question for the tables in the back, it's really a bit of a, uh, a, a teaser, if you will, for tomorrow's discussion. When we get into more of the international arena, but we want to we want to ask you to help us understand how can posts participate in a bi-directional, cross-border e-commerce world. So, um, with that, let me ask the facilitators, those that are left, hold up your uh, hold up your numbers. 
There we go. And uh, I'll give you a minute or two. There you go. Wave them high, right? And uh, for those of you who are yeah, at tables, uh, invite to room, or you're at uh, tables with one or two folks, feel free to uh, switch. When I see the movement start to settle down a little bit, we can start. In fact, there you go. Got a couple moving. Very good. So, there's a little time management. It's about five after five. I'll let you know we're five minutes to the end of the session. In other words, we've got 20 minutes. And uh, we can wrap it up. 15 minutes. I was just asked by John, we'll let him look at the for 15 minutes. All right, so I'll let you know then. Thank you. Thank you.